Oh, hey, my dude, what's up? Hello. Have you ever read in any paper or heard the phrase? I'm just curious. This is a starter. Have you ever heard the phrase polyaxiomatic ethics? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Have I you ever heard? Not. Has anyone ever used the phrase? Wait. Is even poly polyaxiomatic? Is that even like a real word? Every time I search for it, the only thing I find is like no, things talking about ask yourself. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I have like a database of philosophy works, um, and let's see, nothing found. So, okay, um, okay, yeah, go. just curious. Okay, so what are your um? There is no context in which axioms appear when a single axiom says, it. yeah, because it seems like technically everything would be polyaxiomatic, right? Like nothing is built off of like a single. But, um, like, I guess so, but that's just... Yeah, um, it's not but, even wrong, right? Like, we're... It's... Well, the fundamental issue is that they have two two or more, I guess, two in this case. Mm -hmm. and, well, I, first of all, I have an issue even calling them axioms. Uh, well, yeah, because deontology and utilitarianism would be frameworks, not axioms, right? Right, sure. yeah, I think okay. that'd be correct. Um, and moreover... Unless you are arguing for some form of value or moral pluralism, uh, I think most, almost everyone studying moral philosophy would agree that that they are incommensurable, and in that the ontology like, and utilitarianism, or yeah, like uh, the best the best way to the push ask yourself and his his friends on the issue is to ask them to justify that a polyamaxiomatic system. And I'm almost certain what you're going to find is that they're just going to say, oh, well, dude, it's just my my assumed axiomatic system. I'm okay, okay. Yeah, it. yeah, cool. Okay, so I just talked to another guy that is um, <clears throat> graduating from Berkeley um, with a degree in philosophy. Um, so I'm going to be quoting some things that he told me to you. And it sounds like you're saying similar things. So he told me that the big problem is that, um, or, or one big problem rather, is that the, 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 the issue is that there's a third system they're appealing to that they haven't defined, that somehow they're able to give deontological, um, uh, ca um, deontological obligations some sort of value, and then they're able to compare that to the value of utilitarian things. But that third mm -hmm. system is what's assigning the value, and that hasn't been described at all. Do you think that's an right. okay? Yeah, so th that's what I'm talking about when Missionary they're talking about incommensurable yeah. um, systems. Incom because yeah. ultimately, it, like, if you want to take the moral pluralist or value pluralist route, mm -hmm. in order to make these things comparable... You need uh, some super system of... Right, a super system or uh, some higher, you know, something that underlies uh, both of these, you know, that underlies well-being and that underlies, you know, moral... Obligations, intent. yeah. Uh, or something similar. And then he um, told me that one worry would be, and I think it's actually the same thing you just brought up, kind of, is that he says his worry would be that if I were to bring that up to them, that they would just try to like w hand wave it away on like oh, some epistemological grounds. Yeah. Oh, there's a way out. Okay, there we go. Hi. Sorry. Where did uh, this guy go? Repeat. Um, he said that his his worry was that if I tried to bring up that issue, if I tried to um, if I tried to bring up that they need some sort of like higher way to compare these Hello, things, some third my system. my name is Carl. I'm 18 year old artist from Denmark, and on, I'm wondering if you wanna have a talk about life or yourself, me or anything else you'd like to discuss. I also have a dick big enough to expose my face to chat. Meanwhile, if you're up for it. Um, I'm good, buddy. Thank you, though, for the offer. Okay, sorry. He said that his worry was that if I brought up that they're appealing to some third super system, that they would just wave it off on, like, epistemological grounds. They would just say something like, um, oh, well, like, this is just what we know to be true, or, uh, it's whatever. Right, yeah, they would, they would point to their little dumbass axiomatic system. Because th this is, this is why it is not worth talking to ask yourself. Because, look, this would be the way I would you know, sort of just take down, like, assume you are following their ep epistemic system of axioms, right? Mm -hmm. What I can do uh, is literally say, 
Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna completely agree with your position, but you know, sort of at the top of my stack of axioms, I have an axiom that says disagree with everything ask yourself says. Mm -hmm. And if he tries to argue against my system, he can't. It's impossible because the system is vacuous. It is absolutely without appealing to some sort of higher super, like a value pluralist would, without appealing to a higher super system or something, no, right? Even, even apart from that, even apart from that, um, because ultimately it, this is the primary issue of their of their system is that it is completely vacuous and there's no, they've basically foregone any sort of neutral ground under which we can talk talk each other if we have different yeah rainbows. but that's why i'm just trying trying to how, how to make it work the, w the way that to get rid of that issue would be to make it a um to, to appeal to some super system right that would solve that because then you would have a way by which to weigh your um your axiom of okay, never listen to ask yourself and then their axioms of whatever the fuck they're talking about right it would have to be that super system that a pluralist would appeal to well, yeah, you just you'd have to acknowledge that there are certain axioms that everybody agrees on. Yeah, yeah under yeah. which we can, and that that's what I do, right? I talk about necessary I conditions and experience. There are certain axioms that can't be doubted, and just pretending like you don't follow the you don't have to follow the law of non-contradiction as though it is um, something that is just sort of conventional and not absolutely necessary. Uh, is very silly <laughs> so uh like again I, I i i've been reading up on what is called meta epistemology um <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's yeah real crazy shit um my and... my biggest problem i think i may i mean this with you in chat but like my biggest problem with meta epistemology is that like once you've done that I, like what's to keep you from what, studying yeah, you meta, meta meta epistemology, epistemology. yeah 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 like <laughs> I think meta epistemology, like encompasses meta 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 whatever the fuck you want. It's, it's just it's talking about how, what exactly should be the methods of for... evaluating truth. But then why oh. can't you why can't you argue the the methods in which you can discuss the methods for which you evaluate truth? Enemy. Well, you can, and I mean there are papers in meta meta epistemology. I mean it it is true, but again. If you're talking about wanting to find this, I think you're trying to get at that we can't find any sort of foundational justification for certain things in epistemology because we can keep going back and getting... Well, yeah, but if you want to talk about finding those foundational things, isn't that just epistemology? I guess I just don't understand. Um, like, I feel like an epistemologist would just try to say whatever you're discussing in meta-epistemology is just epistemology. Well, so, so the issue becomes... Like, if, if it was 200 years ago, I think people would agree with you, but... But today, now we have a very So many odd... philosophy majors that need something to write about. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's <laughs> that true. That's uh, but also, I think people have largely agreed that when we're talking about these sort of base core foundational things in philosophy, it's not clear that epistemology is the field of... of uh, Thanks for the polite the decline the while I'm at it. I truly like find you an interesting person. Logic, meta Considering I share um, your belief it's all that very most holistic. people are retarded, mm -hmm. uh, have a good stream. So uh, it's it's more of a, I guess it's more of a coherentist approach uh, rather than some string of justifications. Uh, the justification comes from having a, a rather coherent system versus you know, a logically derivable one after the another axiomatic system. Gotcha. So, but again, this, it, the best way to deal with, you know, someone like ask yourself literally just to everything they say, um, you, you can literally say, no, I absolutely disagree with you. You're totally wrong. And then when they say, well, why do you, have, can you explain to me why you're wrong? And you're like, no, because my axiomatic system says I have to disagree with absolutely everything you're saying. Then they'll say, "Well, why are you? Why do you have that axiomatic system?" Oh, well, because you know, ultimately, uh, I'm, I've assumed this system just like you've assumed yours, and you know, they can accuse you of having a stupid axiomatic system, but you can say, "Well, that's just a, a character attack. You've acknowledged that all of our systems we just assume, so you're just, you know, you're using an ad hominem against me rather than actually refuting my system." Uh, and all of a sudden, they either have to acknowledge that from an external view. From a neutral view, absolutely every system, every stupid ass system that you create is 
externally just as valid as another one. Yeah, I don't think and, they're claiming that theirs is like absolutely like objectively correct well, or anything. Then they should acknowledge that. Well, I like, think they would, right? In, like the level of their discussion is just as sort of um, meaningful as me shouting like Ooga Booga 25 times in a row. Like, there's the exact same worth in me chanting Ooga Booga as their stupid ass talk about um, a stupid ass talk about, you know, axioms, right? Um, no, I don't think I necessarily agree. I understand what you're well, saying, but it sounds like you're reducing this more to like, like fat, like epistemological grounds when they're kind of past that. I think. No, they're not past that. They're whenever I get in a discussion with him. Well, because I don't think like a discussion on utilitarianism or deontology necessarily has to be a discussion of epistemology. No. No. It, so the, the issue is that the the grounds on which you reject their mm -hmm. system is that well, how do you justify you know that third. Sort of yeah, however you weigh the differences value, between the two, yeah. Right, and I'm almost certain that the way that they will justify that is with appeal to their axiomatic scheme. Because I can I can create a six-dimensional graph mm -hmm. of well-being, uh, intent, and virtue uh, as three separate axes, axes and have like the three other axes be something else. And I can make a, a little beautiful line all around it. And then someone can say, well, what the fuck does this mean? And I can say, oh, well, in my axiomatic system, I actually are able to translate across all possible ethical theories. It's just in my axiomatic scheme. And there's no way for you to refute that because it's totally vacuous. And that's what their system would be as well. And that's why it's not worth even conversing with them because you're not going to get anywhere. Gotcha. Um, so then if so, in pushing them in a conversation, what I would need to get them to admit or get them to do is to give me some super system by which they weigh their values. Otherwise, everything is completely vacuous. Or absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Like you, you can talk about the math all you like, and I'm sure that that's when people fall into the trap of actually engaging on their level, as though what they're talking about has any sort of justification in the first place, right? People when like start accusing you of not understanding high school math, like. Yeah. You don't understand high school philosophy. That's really the, the core issue here. Um, you can't just spout out random crap and not expect to be called out on the lack of justification. And then when you're called out on the lack of justification, you retreat to your stupid epistemic scheme that is completely vacuous in nature. I mean, I can do the exact same thing in a million different ways. Um, you know, and again, I, if they ever want to come on here and discuss this with me, with me, I would be more than happy. But they don't want to talk to me because every time they do, you know, I call them out on this exact issue. And I, you know, I wrote that long post and they never have actually addressed, you know, the vacuous nature of their system, uh, nor have they defended it uh, as well. So defend vacuous or define vacuous uh, vacuous just means that there's absolutely no way to refute something outside of the system it is in so i mean i can say um, so if i were to say that like jinger joy is the strongest oh, character on, in so the good. hiker or whatever universe and someone's like well okay and i'd be like prove me wrong and I've created the universe and I've created the character. It's like, okay, well, I mean, your statements literally mean nothing. Like everything is completely contrived by you. Like, what am I supposed to say? Something like that, right? Yeah, or you could even say something like, you know, Donald Trump is the best president in the world and you can push someone all the way back and find that at the top of their axiomatic scheme, it's an axiom that says, uh, presidents who are overweight and have shitty hair are uh, the best presidents. Uh, you know, and then you can start to, and then if you can push them back and be like, well, how do you justify that? And you can ultimately say, oh, well, you know, it's just in my axiomatic scheme, dude. You know, we all assume our axioms. Mm -hmm. um, and they might want to come back and say, I'm playing sort of devil's advocate here. They might say, oh, well, there are certain <laughs> axiomatic down. schemes that are unreasonable um, and are obviously silly. Uh, but then, you know, ultimately what they're doing there is they're appealing to convention, uh, in which case their own system gets thrown out because no one follows that sort of, you know, scheme. Uh, so, I, again, I'm unsure how you could ever possibly um, 
ever possibly refute their system from uh, within their their system. So, gotcha, I understand. It's it's just incredibly frustrating because it, it's it uh, fundamental. Oh, I'm getting a ton of pings from their server right now. Um, fundamentally, it's it sends this message about philosophy that is really quite insulting. That uh, ultimately any sort of philosophical system is just as valid as another because we assume it, uh, which is uh, of course ridiculous if, if philosophy was that easy uh you know we wouldn't be having issues like the grounding crisis in philosophy have you seen uh, the shit show of legalization no, it, of yeah, cannabis it, it's, in it's canada ridiculous and it shouldn't be taken seriously uh and ultimately anyone trying to argue uh, for something along their lines is uh ridiculous oh i'm getting pings from their server oh let's see <laughs> look look he's uh <laughs> yeah, he's uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm seeing them talk about me in their server. Rem is so annoying. He reminds me of philosophy vegan in terms of his insatiable appetite for talking about ask yourself. Rem needs to be dummied again. It's cause I bruised his ego by wrecking him repeatedly. I get it. It's just silly though, cause it leads him to say dumb shit. <laughs> Wait, who's saying that? <laughs> ask yourself. Oh, he's gone. Uh, that's funny. Brem is incapable of understanding Isaac. Listening to him is really tilting. Then motherfucker, someone address my objection. Someone explain to me how my axiomatic system, where I say at the very top of my axiomatic tree, that motherfucking Isaac is wrong in every single statement he says. Why is my system somehow less valid and less desirable than ask okay, yourselves okay. with this stupid poly axiomatic bullshit tell me explain to me why mine is less valid than theirs without appealing to some stupid convention or emotional sort of impulse in which case you absolutely forego any standard of rationality okay explain to me just explain to me right now if you can explain to me i will never talk about you again Okay? If you can actually explain to me how we out go outside of our axiomatic schemes and compare them across each other, explain to me how we do this without acknowledging, one, some underlying fundamental axioms that I have been positing since we ever started talking once they started calling your axiomatic system bullshit, or two, some, well, this is the same thing, but some underlying moral axiom, which you won't pause because you're a moral anti-realist. So... If you can ever acknowledge that, uh, hit me up, uh, and we could talk about it. Uh, but I know you won't, <laughs> uh, because it's not something you can object to. Uh, and until you do, I will keep using my six-dimensional polyaxiomatic graph to determine what I should do when someone enters my building holding a baby, and I have to determine whether or not to shoot them. Okay? But, not gonna happen. That would be an interesting uh, thing to see, but I'm really calling them out now, but <laughs> I feel I've got to. Um... Uh, Avi, Avi is cool. Okay, I want to be very clear. Avi is cool. Avi never usually resorts to insults or anything like that, okay? So I like the Avi guy. He's an okay dude. Oh, yeah, I, I don't mind Avi as well. I've had some, but when I've pushed him on stuff, mm -hmm. he, um, he sort of retreats. Yeah, that's fine. I don't, I don't mind that. But it, like, he never goes to like the insults or whatever. Right. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. But when ask yourself, because remember, I, I wrote that really long post that is, I think, a very definitive takedown of his entire system, and he responds to it, completely missing the entire point and saying I misrepresent, and he goes into this bullshit of how, oh, he's not an anti-realist, but he's a a non-realist. Okay, sure. We can forego, um, you know, this, this dichotomy between realism uh, and anti-realism and say it's just a, you know, a misleading uh, sort of distinction. I mean, I would actually probably agree with that because mm -hmm. I would say I, I'm an intuitionist uh, about logic. Sure. Uh, so their, um, did I, their PhD friend emailed me. Um, oh. Yeah. Uh, and I, that's what I walked through that email with the other person on stream. So now Avi is messaging me and saying, like, well, actually, our view is published in the literature already. Um, 
It's really? Called, Let me see. Well, they're Let saying now they're saying that, that it's called Threshold Deontology. Threshold Deontology. Threshold. Well, I think that's th that has to do with the um, the idea that you have uh, certain obligations, but you might have other obligations that can cancel out some obligations, so that you don't have all the same kind of weird problems that Kant has with his deontology. Threshold deontology. I I don't I yeah I'm not I'm not totally seeing how this is. Um... Wait, why can't I put like a thing? What's like the best shit to have, guys? Fuck the laser sight. This is good, right? Threshold. Also, I'm pretty sure threshold deontology and rule consequentialism really start to. Um blend together yeah okay i'm glad you said that fuck because that's what i told the guy earlier because when he started talking about um when he started talking about threshold ontology uh it sounded to me like okay well now it sounds like we're getting really close to like rural utilitarianism like i feel like these are starting to get really close to one another no mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no i agree 100 percent, i agree um <clears throat> but th also this is not uh, what their graph is doing uh, by the way um for one, you don't graph. You you don't assign actual values to uh to to, to actions and assign them like a deontological worth in a well, but you, quantifiable you, way. You could though if you but had you, you can do it, but you can't assign it an actual value. Well, well like, what I'm, I'm saying this is what this is what the crux of the argument is. You could, but you need a third super work. system that you're appealing mm -hmm. to that does it, right? Yeah. So, but, but aside from that, um. I, the most you can do is, so I, I think yesterday on stream you're saying that there isn't like a gradient for moral actions or whatnot for deontology, um, right? An action is binary, right or wrong. What there actually is in that, for example, if we have two people, one is a is someone who has this natural impulse to shoot people. You seem like a smart guy, and you wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on, one second. I'd like to speak to you on stream about climate change. Like, really talk about it and how we're pretty much looking at the end times and how people like you oh, should I mean, be using I've, your platform so to try are... help. Okay, I love you very much and mm -hmm. we might someday, but please don't donate for me to talk to me because I can't, because we'll be doing this all day. I can't possibly get to these, but but send me an email and maybe we can at a future point. Okay, sorry, go for it. Um, uh... <laughs> we were talking, <laughs> what? <laughs> Look at that photo. Someone just said in chat, sleep bat send it in chat. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, like the thing that was irritating me was that yesterday at the end of our conversation, I pretty much uh, said like, well, let's get some educated people in here to hash this out because we've come to some irreconcilable points. And it seemed like we kind of yeah. sort of left it at that point. But then like when I, but then I got pinged later oh, in his room and he's like talking a ton of shit about me. And I'm like, dude, like, why can't we just wait until we have like our educated person to discuss this? And he's like, appeal to authority fallacy. And I'm like, Wait, <laughs> I was like, wait, I mean, what? No. Like, like imagine you, you and him are discussing fucking quantum physics. Yeah, and I'm like, okay. can we bring in a physicist to discuss? He's like, appeal to authority no, fallacy. Appeal to like, authority. Well, like, I don't think that's well, just, a fallacious appeal belief. to authority, but okay. Yeah. And then he's like, belief. and then he keeps like copy pasting, spamming me like um, wiki definitions. Like, look, the wiki stuff, says yeah. you're wrong. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, well, hold on, dude. Like, it's more also, than just a definition to talk about a whole moral system, right? Like, this needs to be contextualized. And, and people need to realize that IEP and SEP are not like the be all end all of philosophical discussion. Well, uh, sure, like, or rather, like these are like definitional starting points, right? But like, if I wanted no, to no, argue no. something about like a complicated like interpretation of quantum mechanics, I wouldn't just like copy and paste like the definition of an electron and be like argue with that now. <laughs> Heisenberg was right, or something like weird, right? Like, it, like it's a more yeah. There's yeah, a reason yeah. why people get whole degrees in this stuff. It's not so they can memorize definitions. It's no. It's understanding the context of everything that these definitions exist in, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, the core issue is that you should be treating these these pages um as uh, you because authors all have their bias or biases and they, they they have their their own fundamental philosophical beliefs and these are of course going to be bled through into their 
their articles on IEP and SCP. Like, I mean, I have, I many of my, or my advisors and my, my professors, many of them have written on uh, IEP and SCP. Uh, and I, I know that there are certain articles on there that are missing some very glaring thing uh, that they're choosing not to include because they sort of just dismiss it as a position. Um, so, yeah, I, like it can be a good starting point, sure, but if you don't actually have the the background to contextualize yeah, it, yeah. yeah, it's like me going on to and I Wikipedia. I don't think it could be compared to uh, because anyone can do Wikipedia in order to publish on SCP or IEP. You need to actually be an expert in the field, mm -hmm. but it'd be like getting a random book from. Um, the library on a very contentious issue like for example what is the best uh interpretation of quantum mechanic uh and say that oh well because this one author says the, the copenhagen uh interpretation is the best that obviously you know this is the one that we're using um so it, it's valid as a starting point uh in order to it's valid as a starting point to be to begin to understand certain things within the field of philosophy. It is not a valid uh, way in which to uh, show that Win someone else is wrong. an argument about a complicated, yeah. Yeah, because you, you don't have the necessary background to thoroughly engage in that topic. Uh, and it's quite insulting to people who professionally study it every single day of their lives uh, to somehow summarily dismiss uh, their expert opinions uh, because they might disagree with an IEP or uh, SCP article. It's it, it's it's a bit ridiculous, uh, and that is a it, it is just a, a reality that people think everyone can do out. philosophy, uh, which they can. Well, but not they do. Can do well, well, yeah. Unfortunately, right? That's the yeah, because it, it's less clear to people that a lot of a lot of philosophical arguments uh, include really complex arguments founded on i mean the hardest thing in philosophy is reading it, mm -hmm. that is that's just <laughs> the reality and i mean people send me screenshots of people in the ask yourself discord talking shit about kant constantly and complaining about people invoking kant <laughs> when I, i've said this before i think kant is the most important um, oh, it's funny that they're evoking threshold deontology, but they regularly dismiss Kant and refuse to, refu refuse to read Kant. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's really, it's really quite funny. Um, like, of course, Kant has issues, but one, uh, you know, you can divorce his, you know, moral philosophy uh, from his epistemic philosophy um, and his metaphysics. Um, but you know you got to read on these issues you can't just go on to scp and take that position uh and then argue it to the end of the days it, it, it philosophy doesn't work if ever everyone did philosophy that way we would just have a shit ton of bad philosophy even more than we already have mm -hmm. um, you'd be kicked out of an undergraduate uh, class for doing that because it's academically dishonest it's refusal to engage with the actual material of philosophy um, that's what I would say. And again, if if anyone, I, I'm 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 calling them out. If anyone wants to thoroughly explain to me why my axiomatic system is worse than theirs, please hit me up, um, because no one has done so so far, and I'm more than willing to have that conversation. But I mean, you heard yesterday. Uh, they didn't want me to come on stream because uh, they they know that I call them out on this shit, and they claim, you know, I I don't know why they they it sort of sounds I guess narcissistic, but it's literally the fact that they cannot refute my my objection. It's impossible. Um, is there anything wrong with just going a tiny bit into philosophy for something like stoicism? Stoicism isn't philosophy. <laughs> Stoicism is the Unabomber's manifesto philosophy. That's I've always said that. But who was the who was the PhD dude that emailed you? Like what what is his background? Um <laughs> Oh my god, this guy.
was he in um hold on i'll like, send it to you um i don't know okay. i don't know what their background is but um it's kind of funny that um they use the word in their email they use the word threshold to ontology and now that's what avi and um i guess ay are going to start mm-hmm. saying well well now we're actually threshold to ontologists yeah mm-hmm. so i don't know if it's because they just got their friend to tell them this or what but hold on yep Although it's kind of funny that at the start of her email, she makes it clear that she doesn't defend their view of ethics. <laughs> but, really? but I mean, yeah, she puts that right in the first right. Um I don't defend their view of ethics, but I think one of your criticisms is misguided. I think it's kind of funny. Um, what is your email? Or actually, I can just copy paste the email. Here you go. Um, yeah, you just copy paste. And I can send you my email if you want. Yeah, fuck, never mind. Just uh, send me your email. Okay. <laughs> This is like a little bit bull. Mm, I don't know if this is bullshit or not, but like one thing I had to do this a lot when I was discussing. Um, Good to go. When I was doing, uh, when I was diving into the biology shit um, with like the race realism and everything, I forwarded you the email. I think you should have gotten it right. Um, one thing that made me worried was yeah, when people would start discussing like very complicated topics and they would use phrases. And then I would like, I would try to just Google the phrases and like on Google Scholar, like none of these phrases ever came up in any published literature every, anywhere. So like, it kind of made me wonder if like, w- like what exactly is your background? Cause most of these conversations that race realists have are very, very, very high level, complicated, um, you know, conversations like, but none of these phrases are found in any published literature ever. So is this just like your own original kind of thought and you have like no published literature on the matter? Like, I don't understand, you know? Um, yeah, was always yeah, yeah, I mean, so when someone is claimed to like marry, you know, like utilitarianism and deontology, and then they're using phrases that don't exist anywhere in the published literature, it's like, it seems kind of strange, you know, but yeah, I, it's an issue even within something like, um, you know, even in like professional philosophy, people use, I also think that's one of the hardest parts of philosophy is it's grappling with. Like the amount of terminology i think people are often really put off by philosophy because you know we use all these really complicated words but it's literally because we're 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 delving into the, the most complex yeah like, you have to most... because otherwise things are going to be confused and shit. yeah and, and lost in you know translation and <laughs> creating words and using words that don't have their standard definition in certain areas of philosophy um it, you know is obviously really dangerous and uncharitable and you know it, it's it's just disgusting in bad faith ultimately mm-hmm. um UAV, and I, I don't know exactly the way in which you can you know, combat that UAVs other than operating. rigorously defining your 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 definitions at the start of your discussion yeah but i think one of the I... biggest problems it feels like um this is why i don't mind the avi guy as much like i think that isaac's huge problem is that his ego is like insanely massive holy shit <laughs> like uh i like i saw a lot of people complain to me about this like well actually people on a server like will send me dms complaining about it but then i had heard about it before and after but, like holy shit yikes look at chat yeah i tried to ban um i tried to nuke it but i don't think my bot is up right now sorry i don't know how to put it in sub mode fuck I know this this person. You know wait who? I I've seen their their why have I why do I know this person? Like I've seen this person on Reddit before. Oh, this uh, this I've talked to this person before. They've directly engaged with me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, this person, this person complained to me about calling Kant the most influential, influential philosopher. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my posts on your subreddit. Um, your argument life. seems to be formally. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really know. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, now semi- Avi is copy-pasting definitions of threshold ontology into their <laughs> Discord. Uh, it would have been nice if they would have known anything about this before. I, yeah. like, I feel like they literally just discovered this word like, oh shit, like, this is our saving grace. Like, okay, we just got to copy-paste definitions from this, even though they didn't know what this was until, I guess, 12 hours ago. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. 
So ultimately, this um, this email has only said mm -hmm. that uh, it differs from your utilitarianism, but it's different on polyaxiomatic. So like, ethics. I, I think to to explain, yeah, and then that's another phrase that polyaxiomatic ethics. These are phrases that I can't find anywhere. I've no, I can't I can't even begin to evaluate these one because mm -hmm. Dantel's utilitarianism aren't. Uh, aren't axioms, so I don't know why you would even refer to them as such. Um, and then two, because polyaxiomatic doesn't seem to make much sense as a phrase, because everything uses multiple axioms. And then, yeah, but um, the, the main crux of her email, which I can agree with if I'm being very charitable, my main problem was that it felt like what they were doing is they were analyzing deontological statements and assigning them utility so that they could graph them against utilitarian statements. But I think what the main crux of her argument was, and then what the um, guy that I brought on earlier said, if we're being charitable, is that what's actually happening is it's not measuring utility strictly there's actually a third system that's being applied here and mm -hmm. that system is capable of graphing utilitarianism and deontology on the same values but they need to define that third system is essentially what the guy said which and i think that's what she's getting at in this email right i i'm i'm seeing if i can bring my own professional <laughs> philosopher who studies um well like i don't know if it's even necessary at this point because even in her email it seems like I, I, her main criticism was oh, no. that like he's, he's I can't call their strict what oh sure. Her, her main criticism was that I can't call their strictly utilitarianism, which I guess is, is true, sure. But um but she even she says she's not gonna defend their view of ethics. And that's the person that was the most biased person that they could find to defend their point of view. And even she says she's not gonna defend their view of ethics. So like I, I don't know if there's much left to be said at that point, you know, like Okay. Have you ever heard of polyaxiomatic ethics? I said no, sounds fake. This is a uh, someone who studies uh, moral philosophy. A second person who studies moral philosophy. These are both graduates. Mm -hmm. uh, also says polyaxiomatic. What the fuck? Sounds dumb. <laughs> Did you tell him that what there are multiple axioms now? What about threshold deontology? Establishing UAV data splice. Uh, this is just appeal to authority. Ugh. Appeal to authority <laughs> fallacy. He says, my axioms are innumerable Holy and shit. my day is ruined. <laughs> he says nope to threshold deontology. So, I, to be fair, I can find things about threshold oh, deontology yeah. if I Google I it, right? And I'm familiar with the concept as well, right? We, I think we've even talked about these concepts where deontology yeah. has some problems. So you can like value, you can weigh obligations against each other in order to come up with more preferable solutions to things, right? Yeah, I mean, because uh, if I go on to like... The, the philosophy database insert here. Um, search nice. for threshold deontology. Mm -hmm. There's a total of. Okay, well, most of these are not. Uh... <laughs> Terrorism, Our supreme insert. emergency, and killing the innocent. Oh my god. Um, yeah, it's not actually really, there's actually not much here on it. Um, it's nearly in the bag. Yeah, it's actually, I, I, I thought there'd actually be more than, than there really is, uh, here on it. There actually isn't that much. So it, it I feel like they're actually, they're trying to say like, oh, you don't know our really, uh, niche term. <laughs> Uh, well, no, no, no. It's more that she, when that, when that friend, their friend, emailed me, um, she used that phrase, and I think that she showed them the email that she sent me, and now they're using the phrase too. Since she just, they probably just saw that phrase for the first time in their lives, so now they're gonna jump on that as a way of justifying their system. Like, oh shit! Like this is actually a real term we can use this to describe our shit. Yeah. So I, I, I see threshold deontology. There's a like a single. A, a, maybe three publications here. No, two publications here that use threshold uh, deontology. There's this one uh, found in a book called Law, Economics, and Morality by two people I've never heard of. Um, if I search them in the actual like philosophers database, they they yield. One of them yields no result. Um, the other one teaches at. Uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, um, and then the other one only briefly, briefly remarks on it in a, a paper from 2011 uh, in Legal Studies. So, 
it, it's very much unreasonable to assume. I, I think the reason actually this person probably found out about it is because it has a mention uh, in the deontological ethics uh, SCP page. I think that's why that I think that's the only reason that this person has. Oh, and do you know why they do? Because Larry Alexander, the only person to to, to really use this uh, use this term, is the one who published uh, this brief 2011 article on threshold deontology. So he invented the term and then used it in his SCP article. So that's the reason that people have figured it out. So apart from him and one other person within the literature, no one else has ever used threshold deontology before. Oh. And that is the only reason why that this person that emailed you is talking about threshold deontology. Um, and, and you might call, um, you might call the SCP, um, you might call, uh, what's that? Uh, okay. Uh, you might call this like an appeal to authority or whatnot, but <laughs> oh my god, hold on! Did you see this? Did you see this? <laughs> so going forward, I'll be referring to myself as a threshold deontologist. As a... <laughs> uh, I've, it's like it's literally like Sam Harris. It's where you do all this work to feel like you've like figured out your own like super unique moral system, and it's like, well, actually, there's already tons of writing on this. You're not re why are you trying to reinvent the wheel? Like, just pick up a book and just copy paste someone else's, because it's pretty much where you're winding up at. Yeah. I, so I am not. So I'm like 99% positive then that what happened was they asked their PhD philosopher friend. They probably explained their system in the best way they possibly could, and or or explain my criticisms, I guess, because she wouldn't even defend their system. And then she's like, well, this is the email that I'm going to send Destiny. They saw that email. And they're like, oh shit. What did she mean by threshold ontology? They looked it up, and now they're like, um, oh shit, yeah, let's just be this. This sounds really good, and that's exactly what's going on now. I'm yeah, glad exactly. then that they could contact their friend because it seems like I helped them figure out more about their moral system than they ever could on their own. Because all it took was for them to talk to their friend for like two seconds to send me an I email, know. and now they've learned just as much about themselves as I have about their moral well, system via her sending that fucking email. Jesus like, Christ! I, I don't want to. You know, this might be false, but again, this is what I suspect from going through the actual database of of the term special deontology. I, I think really this person knows uh, this person that, you know, that emailed you. I think they got their stuff from SCP, just like. I mean, um, I'm willing to be more charitable towards oh, them. No, if they're I literally like a am. PhD, like philosopher, so like all. They found it on SCP mm -hmm. and then probably traced it back to that primary uh, Larry Alexander paper. But I feel like the way that they came across and the way that Ask Yourself is making it seem is that it's a very reputable thing within the field. Oh, when sure. It's when it's just like a really fringe thing that a couple yeah, people kind like, of like flirted this with. This is the fringe of the fringe of the fringe of the fringe of the fringe, okay? Um, also, oh my god. Uh, my, my friend, this Gadgetson, he said, this is fucking moronic. Units of utility. Hello, yes, I'd like to open a joint account with a down deposit of 5,000 utils. Well, I mean, a utilitarian could view things that way, right? Like, that's how they do it. I'm not really. I don't know any utilitarian who, who can actually... Well, like, you don't have direct measurements, but utilitarians, I mean, that's pretty much what you claim to do, right? You're maximizing your value of utility, whether you have a direct way to map it or not. Like. So, do you, can I add yeah. these... You guys? Okay. Uh, Wait, add which? Oh, to this call? Oh, can, can we go in the this? Uh, oh, oh, go into the Discord? I don't think you can drag him in. Can't you just add him to the call? I, I don't know how. How do I do that? Wasted Connection info. I think I have to call you. Let me um, call you. Yeah, sure, do that. Okay. Okay, I'm out of them. Hey, Hi, what's Nick. up? I'm hey, drunk, though. Hey, what's up? what's up? Hey, everyone. Give him the graph. Ram, just give him the graph. <laughs> oh, yeah, have you seen... I just want you guys to know that I have married utilitarianism with deontology, and I want to show you how I've done it in my great graph. It's just high school math. If you don't understand it, then you're just dumb. That's nice. Give him the graph, Ram. Also, by the, the way, I have no hand. background. I have no background in philosophy whatsoever, but I've still solved this, so here. That's nice. You should get this published, you make money. I don't need to publish it. Published philosophers are wasting their lives. I could talk about it in Discord instead.
<laughs> Where? That's the way of publishing, dude. Just wasting your life in a more mediocre way. Exactly. You should do it in a grand way and make your money. Someone in the chat link the uh link the graph. Somebody give graph us the graph. Part. They made a new graph too when their last graph didn't work. So I want the graph. Is Alvin's calling me a piece of shit because he's not invited? Who's calling you a piece of shit? Zalvain, invite Zalvain. <laughs> I... He has a PhD, I don't have a PhD yet. That's true, Zal does have a PhD. However, what a waste Destiny, of time. I warn you, he is a German idealist. Idealism. Like, if, you, if you found Marty incomprehensible. Marty is a bad interlocutor. Like, real bad. He's, he's nonsensical. Really? I agree. I do agree with that. He might be really smart, but I had a really hard time talking to him. But it seems like how other... Much, uh, how much have you discussed with him? Because he, he likes... He focuses on technicalities and tries really hard not to see his interlocutor's point, which is bad. Yeah, that's what I felt like. That's one of the reasons why I like Rem. Like, even though... Uh, I, I, like, it feels like Rem understands what I'm trying to say. Because obviously I'm a... Yeah, I, I like I, I don't know any of the official terminology at all because I, I like I really do have no background in philosophy except for what I've read That's on the fine. internet. Yeah, but Rem seems to like have a really easy time understanding what I'm saying and he'll rephrase it in a more technical way that I can agree with and then show me why oh it's God. right or wrong. I can still notice you're a famous streamer because you're really good at talking fast. <laughs> Sorry, I tried it. I, I posted the graph uh, in the chat now. What do you oh think? wow, this is very cool. <laughs> I wrote uh, something that actually uh, deals with this issue when I was in undergrad. Um, what heard... was it by Larry Alexander? What? <laughs> was it by the one guy who talks about threshold deontology called Larry Alexander? No. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought maybe you had. There's um. That's a How is that different from rule utilitarianism, though? Oh shit! That's what I thought. <laughs> Can you elaborate? This was my whole fucking argument yesterday. I was like, I don't understand why this isn't just... You're basically saying that, like, sometimes you want to do some things, and other times you want to do other things based on what oh feels the best. God. Why not just craft rules, a utilitarian oh, system, and make it work that way? But his reason why he didn't want to use rule utilitarianism is because he said, well, rule utilitarianism in a vacuum reduces to just utilitarianism. <laughs> that was well, his... No, no, I, no, that's not true. Like, you can't, um... You can't convert everything to utilitarianism or from utilitarianism. Sure. I'm sorry, I'm not very articulate because I'm not a native English speaker. Also, yeah, yeah, I'm I understand. Um, but yeah, That's the reason weird. why you get real utilitarianism is, be is because some things can't be properly understood as uh, utilitarian calculus. Is calculus? What, what? You get what I mean? Yeah, calculation. Sure. Barry! I'm the only black person here. And, um,. It's useful. Also, it's useful for like I don't know if you talked to Rem about this. For like, um, if you need principles that are not strictly uh, related to harm or well-being, like for example, if you have uh, epistemic norms, you know, uh, scientific inquiry, laws of logic, uh, mathematical concepts. That's for that you can't think of those things as a. So rule util is nice. But also, the big problem here is that you can't mathematize um, the thing. So if you got your deontology and um, you want to like uh, say that uh, your example is like, yeah, murder is worse than rape, etc. You have to produce a set of um, values that give an order of importance between things. But then you can't mathematize that, this in an actual calculus, right? right. That, yeah, so that's what I was saying about how you can't like part <laughs> what? Come again? You can't chart I'm like olives. We're so good. You like olives, guys? No, Pardon? that's they're fucking disgusting. Ugh. No, well, I disagree with you. Uh. You're immoral. Ban yourself. What? Okay. What? Wait. What is disgusting? Olives. Olives. It doesn't like olives. Oh. So uh, okay, wait. So then, to Keanu, what you're saying, I'm just making sure I have an understanding. You're base. So just I'm yeah. repeating what what I've kind of like gathered earlier is that what you're saying is that if you want to chart deontological values or, or obligations yeah. against like utilitarian ones, you need like some third super system that you have to appeal to that is able to like assign value to all of these things. And that third. Um, not not really, because you could just use mathematics. The real problem is the unit, right? 
Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, how do I, how do I, like, it, let's say utilitarian wants to maximize well-being among all people. Yeah. Well, how do I graph a deontological you know, obligation out of that? Like, what unit? How do I express that in a utilitarian yeah, sense? Yeah. Um, have you? Uh, oh no, you said you don't do philosophy at all. Have you read Bentham at all? On, no. On no. He's okay. read Bertrand Russell. Yep. The Problems of Philosophy. That one oh, intro book. book. I like this book. It's a good book. It's very clear. It's a good book. See, told you. There you go. You like it? It was very dry, but yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> very dry, yeah. Russell is not very entertaining. Uh, anyway, yeah. So, in uh, Principles of uh, Law and Morality, I think is the English title, Ben Times gives uh, four criterion, uh, criteria sorry, for the utilitarian calculus. I don't know them by heart. Hold on, I'll tell you. So, basically, he wants to dodge uh, the problem of mathematics by giving criteria. Those are intensity, duration, certainty, propinquity, fecundity, purity, extent. Well, I have and no idea what the fuck you just said. Can you say that again? I'll explain. Yeah. So, he gives us seven criteria calculus, right? So, they are according to Wikipedia because I don't know them by heart. They're in the book, though. Okay. How strong is the pleasure? Uh, so, it, it's I, I, intensity, right? So, okay. for example, now I'm eating olives. It's less intense than, I don't know, uh... Sex. Sure. Okay, sex, dude. <laughs> um, duration? How long will the pleasure last? Not That's so long it. for you. Certainty is pretty important. It's, um... I'm sorry. I'm going to ban you, dude. <laughs> I'm gonna ban you from the call. <laughs> what was I saying? I love you too, buddy. Um... Certainty is how likely is the pleasure uh, to occur. It's basically the risk factor, right? I just That's went on a date with politics. a woman like, whose um, father one thing is American, mother is South what, African. Like, study they live in Canada. France and send her that boarding school to be, in the UK um, and she is pro-Brexit. A system that's Kill made to study political decisions, right? Not um, not individual decisions, originally. Then it, 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 it transformed into something that's more oriented towards personal ethics, but originally, Bentham was concerned with informing political decisions. So certainty was a big problem. Like uh, you couldn't, for example, take a very risky political gambit. That wasn't okay. Um, the fourth factor is propinquity. Um, that's a big word to say uh, when the thing will occur. For example, if you're saying that the pleasure or the harm will occur very far away in time, it can be a political problem because it might be um, will I say it? It might concern subjects that are not alive yet. For example, global warming, right? So everybody, I, I'm sure, will agree that we have to do something, ecologically speaking. But maybe you, me, etc. Everyone who's in this call might be dead by the time the conditions improve or worsen. But we still have to take that into account, right? It's a bit, it's a bit complicated. Fecundity is the five fa fifth sorry, factor. It's um, basically chain reactions, like for example, um, the probability that the action will be followed by sensations of the same kind. For example, if you get a good education, it's a good utilitarian calculus because then you're gonna get a good life, right? So, but if you do heroin, like it might be an incredible pleasure, but you're probably gonna like put your life in the shitter. Then there's purity. Um, uh, it's basically um, that it's not going to attract opposite sensations. For example, if you do something that's that, like the example I gave about hero, heroin, sorry, heroin is pretty good. Or um, like if you do something that's, that feels really, really good, um, if it attracts later in your life things that are really bad, well, obviously you, you have to take that into consideration. And the seventh criteria is the most important. It's a core tenet of utilitarianism, and it was pretty innovative thing in that era, even though it's obvious to us now, nowadays. It's the extent, it's how many people will be affected by the thing. Um, you know, like trolley problem and all. And that's pretty that's pretty important because in in, in, uh, in Util, everyone matters as one. Even animals, even babies, even someone who's very rich or very nice. Everyone is only one for the calculus. Aggregation. Sure. Bantam says, like, we're supposed to take this into account, but it's not really a calculus, right? It's more like an evaluation. And there's another big problem here is that um, Bentham says that every man is um, the master of what's pleasure and pain to him, right? To themselves, I mean. 
But the thing is, um, if you concede this, then you have no reliable way of um, of knowing what your actions are going to do. Because you don't know what's good and bad for other people. So you need some sort of criterion for goodness or badness anyway. If you're going to make um, decisions that have consequences, right? Mm -hmm. For example, if you have kids, if you have multiple kids, I mean, um, you have rough general idea as a parent and as a human being of what's good for them, even though you might be uneducated on the topic. But Bentham bites the bullets and says that um, um, supposedly every man can have wildly different preferences, which is obviously true, right? But then he proposes no way of figuring out what's good for someone else, which is pretty important in like everyday life. Like for a doctor, obviously you have a very precise idea of what's good for a patient. And if you care for someone, anyone, then you have a general idea of what's good for them, even though this knowledge might be very limited. And there's just no good way, I think, unless you add extra extra things in the moral system that um, to inform practical action unless you concede that you need to know what's good for other people and not merely yourself. Those are the problems I have with utilitarianism generally. Um, I think they're pretty manifest in the graph you do because like all, we're always attracted to formal systems and we want to like, <laughs> Next, <laughs> next uh, people are getting, it's freaking out about your smacking of your lips. And I feel oh, moral duty to inform you of this. I forgot we are on stream. I'm sorry. I apologize to the viewers. <laughs> I hope I'm boring everyone. <laughs> no, no. People are just freaking out about Hi. it. Hi. Okay. Well, you know, like, we got it. Like we got problems. Problems of utilitarianism. Um, okay. Yeah. Is there um? Oh, is there anything else relevant to discuss here, Rem? Or otherwise, oh, I, just... Nick, I want to hear next. Relevant stuff, dude. So Nick. many things to say, but like, whatever. Let's move on. Nick, do you... are you aware of the... Nick is very well aware of my crusade against moral like, what, am, what am I wearing? No, no. <laughs> you are very aware of oh, my yeah. crusade against moral anti-realism. Yeah, like, you know, I've been reading Mackie recently. Uh, Ma like J.L. Mackie? Yeah. Oh, that's, I, I'm sorry. Have you read him? Yeah. I'm sorry, yes. I interrupted you. Go ahead, dude. Well, um, so... This 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 person who made this graph is a moral anti-realist. Yeah. Um, well, why does it make a graph about how to calculate some good things then? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, and are you aware of like the whole axiomatic scheme? They they say that everything is just a, an assumed scheme of axioms, um, and that uh, sounds circular to me. But okay, sounds what? Circular. Oh yeah. Well, so okay. So they. They'll acknowledge that it's circular, uh, and then they'll say, "Well, circularity is just an assumed axiom." So, uh, haha, you can't get me because I don't include this type of circularity as a refutation uh, in my axiomatic scheme. Wow, it's not that axioms work, but whatever. No, yeah, oh, Ross is here also. Is take, yeah. Everybody no, should be logic. Is going to take that as an excuse to take something seriously, right? Yeah, yeah I, a critique is that my system is circular and then the response to that is yes of course it's circular you're just going to go well whatever that's mm -hmm. not convincing and well as long as you don't care about the counter arguments the opposition can't win right i mean sure What's... but you then you get ushered out the room for being loot. that's why philosophy we talk about be... the graph i'm not I've had a look at the graph about four times and i don't get what's going on in there it's just it seems so to be brilliant. emulating it's so, it's so obvious, like, the dude says that you can use the ontology, but for big questions you need util. And that's exactly the, the point of political rule util. But, right. you know, that's why people should read the classics, because this shit has been studied already. And people yeah, are reading about it. So, maybe the, not. That's kind of boring, I don't know. The thing they're invoking now is called threshold deontology. What? Um, and I sent, I, I took a screenshot of that email. For Russian you. deontology? Threshold deontology. Threshold? Oh, threshold. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. And that email, what do you think of that email? Uh, yeah, well, it falls right under the things I said earlier about units. Right, exactly. So, would you just say, um, 
like so you, you said that you think the graph just because is really rule utilitarianism right do people but enjoy listening to us right now i do Pardon? that's all that matters Fuck everyone else keep going oh okay, okay. works for me um do you do you think that because they say again this is a straightforward contradiction for the rule utilitarian but it is a permissible statement on poly axiomatic ethics thus they are not identical Dude. First of all, I'm not sure why the term polyaxiomatic like even what the exists. Fuck? Yeah, it just yeah, you're supposed, like every system has main, multiple axioms. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So okay, <laughs> I, let me let me explain this real quick so yeah. we can move past like dumb shit. So when they say polyaxiomatic, what they mean yeah. is that they're trying to reconcile multiple frameworks. I don't know. They call it they probably call it polyaxiomatic because it sounds really smart. That's my guess. But that, that's what they're trying to say. So they're reconciling multiple well, frameworks. Just hybrid. I don't know. Okay. Because polyaxiomatic sounds more cool than hybrid. I'm, I'm impressed by the word. There's like different roots stuff like that okay yeah, yeah go ahead okay. so there we go okay rem oh sorry <laughs> um finish your explanation well, yeah so again this is a straightforward contradiction so why do you think do, do you agree with that that they aren't identical in this case uh like what 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 difference for, what difference you rule utilitarianism from their system it's the same fucking thing like, literally the only difference between consequentialism and the ontology is, like, the direction of the arguing, so to speak, right? And you, you can translate the, the exact same normative propositions from one system to the next. In most cases, even though you can't translate the system itself, right? Right. So they say... It may be tempting to draw a similarity between rural utilitarianism and polyaxiomatic. He's saying ethics. refuting something you said. Uh, yeah, he he is trying to say that poly this system, this graph thing, is yeah. not the same as as rural utilitarianism. Okay, yes, uh, because the statement we ought to act in accordance. Oh, with okay. Is, he's saying there is no formal contradiction because okay, yes. Because the, the the ontological rules are excluded from the calculus. Yeah, big deal. That's not a big difference. Who cares? Well, well and then so like my months, my main criticism was that anytime you, you can tell me if this is is reasonable or not, but my main criticism was that if you're taking deontological obligations and you're finding a way to assign utility to them, and then you're weighing it against utilitarianist things, you're essentially just engaging in consequentialism. Ultimately, that's what it feels like to me. Well, yeah, totally. Like the point of having deontological uh, principles is that they, they can't be fouled up in 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 the Utah framework, right? So like, yeah, that, could, that a utilitarian could never utilitarian. analyze a deontological obligation. It just doesn't. That type of obligation doesn't exist in a, in a utilitarian or a consequentialist framework. Well, you can translate the same normative thing in the end, but th th it's formulated differently. Okay. What do you mean by that? Can you elaborate? Well. Um, for example, if you like, let's say, moral principles, like, uh, I don't know, something stupid, like you should obey your parents, right? Yeah. You can have different types of grounding for that. You can say that you should always obey your parents because that, that can be universalized in a low blah, 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 blah. So that would be deontological. Uh, or you can say that you must always uh, abide by your parents' decisions because that always provides the best... Um, the best consequences. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I, so here what you're doing, t tell me if I'm right. If I ever say what you're doing, I'm just trying to rephrase it so that you know that I know that I understand it. Okay. So what it sounds like you're saying is that we have a value and that value is, um, the value is, un is uh, um, following your parents' orders or whatever, right? Um, that's yeah. your value. And then your, the framework through which you analyze it is either deontological or utilitarian, right? Well, yes. Well, there are other frameworks, but yeah, that's sure, what sure. I'm coming at. So then you have what, the same you have one thing and there are multiple ways of getting at it. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that it's if you take if you right. analyze something and you assign a utility to it, that analysis is no longer done through a deontological framework. So for instance, if I say I have an obligation to behave or listen to my parents. If I have that obligation, then I can't take that obligation and assign it a utility. That's just an obligation. If I want to give it a utility, then I would have to go back to the value and analyze it through a consequentialist framework. I can't just take the deontological obligation and assign a utility to set obligation. Right? That's what it feels like to me. Am I wrong on that or am I well, as soon as you as you take the principles and try to think of it in utilitarian terms, you are positing the the um, the petitio principi that utilitarian needs. So yes, you you are going out of the ontology, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So so my whole problem with the graph then was that as soon as you take 
deontological obligations and you start charting them like onto uh, onto utility graphs you're no longer engaging in anything resembling deontology you're just consequentialist at this point that that was like my main criticism yeah that, that, but that's something that's yeah that totally the thing that is that it's always done by undergrads or stuff like that because it sounds so seducing to try and convert everything into a single system right people are usually so interested in you know theories of everything like mm -hmm. people who are like smarter than average usually are intellectually curious and want to try and unite something into a single system which is commendable but obviously very difficult and sometimes not possible and this kind of unity of moral theories um is always some kind of frankenstein monster that's yeah students work. sure but the thing is it's just like there are good reasons for why it doesn't work and obviously nobody's concerned with it because philosophy can be boring especially moral philosophy <laughs> there, there can i step in here adrian like so well, remember... it's, it's, i love it but it's tedious do you remember right. luke from the philosophy chart yeah. 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 He had a good explanation of deontology was that it's not specifically about the rules as a lot of people seem to think, but it's about the construction of the rules. Which is, you know, your justification an end in itself or humanity, or I don't know, contractualism as in rules and scanlon. It seems to me that what you try to do, you can assign utility speculatively to deontological rules but the point of de a deontological system isn't to say that these are the rules it's to say like this is what's underlying the rules this is why you follow the rules this is how your practical action is informed by um, yeah I, I see what you're getting at barry but i think there's this distinction here between high order normative theories and low order normative theories like there, you can be a, a deontological system that's not met meta-ethically deontological so yeah, deontology is about the machine that produces the propositions. But when you're talking about deontology, for example, in medicine or in care ethics or in like, I don't know, uh, thanatology, you're concerned about the propositions themselves and you call them deontology by metonymy. Be propositions, right? It'll be maxims or reasons for action. Uh, I don't know, dude. That's just, just how language works. Like if you, if you, like doctors talk about deontology of medicine. But they're not concerned with the machine that produces the statements, merely the statements themselves, right? But I see what you mean, though. I think we've, we've confused everybody else, though. Yeah, I think this might be a bit... I, I want to I see <clears throat> if we can do one final thing here, which is... Because, Destiny, would you call yourself a moral anti-realist still? Um, yeah, I do. Do you want to get into that? after all of my... No, no, but you, do you acknowledge that moral statements have a truth value? Um, what do you mean by truth value? That they have a, a true or false value. A moral proposition must necessarily have a true or false value. There like, must be. Oh, why, are you, why are you asking him that question when you haven't even asked him what is his theory of truth? <laughs> yeah. He's a correspondence there. No, okay, listen, here's the real truth. The real reality is I have not fucking read anywhere near enough things on theories of truth to know. I think I, I, think I, I yoinked a correspondence from that, from literally that intro to philosophy book. So I, it the sounds philosophy. good to me right now, but maybe there would be. Philosophy. Yeah. Uh, but <clears throat> because uh, be because he he just like if I, I, I don't want to come on dude why are you emotionally involved in the conversation you gotta chill <laughs> I I I, <laughs> I don't want to frame destinies like your system wrong but you you sort of hop around and you you'll say that you're like a, a an ethical egoist no okay wait, wait can i can i describe can i describe this okay because okay, yeah. you're doing a bad I, job at being an interlocutor yes, right now okay i'm sorry okay I, I'm very so sorry. here is what i mean when i say i am a moral anti-realist okay all i think is that i don't believe that moral fact can be f so i am a. I think you would say i'm a materialist right i don't believe in dualism or any spooky anything like that everything i believe is found in the natural universe or whatever and there's nothing beyond that okay and then i don't what, what think mathematical objects what um no don't no don't, no, no wait no, no shut the fuck up no i would say no I don't, I don't believe that i don't believe that math is found in the in the natural universe i wouldn't say that the math is like a, a ideas that exist in human minds right is what oh, i would no. say um okay. so 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 it's objective so it's what math is subjective then um what do you, what do you mean by subjective well, it depends on, on, on the human mind. Therefore, it depends on the subject. It's sure. Subject. Sure. So I would say that like if all humans were eliminated from the universe, that math would necessarily disappear, right? Okay. Well, I'm not really asking like, uh, okay, like I'm not going to take you down that rabbit hole. Okay. 
that's, that's, that's why I said, oh no, because I was afraid we'd go down that route. Okay, yeah. so so just... if, so since I only believe in it, it, since I am a materialist and I don't I don't believe that moral fact can be found in the uh, in the natural universe. So for instance, if one person murders another person, I don't think yeah. that there is any sort of right or wrong that is that is seen by the universe or whatever that exists in the universe. So these are just kind of like human constructs that we can construct moral systems, but ultimately they're not reducible to any type of moral I like see. fact. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I think I, I don't know if I'm a non cognitivist or an error theory, but I think I fall on the on the end of the error theory. Well, where I would I say, see, yeah. I, um, I see your point, and I think it's what most lay people have uh, as as a position. And I think Ram. Did Fuck you, you Ram. <laughs> what? I think Ram did you the service by trying to show what you think into um, into a a, a label. You know. Um, what do you mean? Well, I mean that um, you know the names of positions aren't that important. Like <clears throat> most people who will call themselves anti-realists, like oh, in philosophy. Well, the reason are... I did it is because you know I use companions. Yeah, and I'm guilt. sorry. Did the middle of my sentence interrupt the beginning of yours? <laughs> sorry, Jack. Okay, um, I, I I drank rum the whole evening. I graded papers. I'm trying to talk. Okay, I, I, I apologize, Nick. Go ahead. I appreciate. I, mean... I don't know what I was saying. Yeah, I was saying that many people who will call themselves moral anti-realists actually have like very significant uh, theoretical disagreements between each other. And oh, it's yeah. important to figure out what like people think precisely and why, what, what are their reasons for the positions they hold rather than just labeling them under one big umbrella. I think it's not very productive. To and be fair, someone... to be fair real quick, Rem has taken a, a great pains to understand my position. He, I don't think yeah, he's understand me a such a nice person. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you, Nick. Um, but the reason I, 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 I've labeled it, the only reason I think I've, I've labeled a Destiny oh, anti-realist is because the way in which this all came about was in a discussion with Ask Yourself, who is the, he is the anti-realist. This guy's an idiot, though. Pardon I mean, me? He's stupid. He's what? An idiot? Yeah, he's an idiot. Well, yeah, we know that, but... I was trying to show why he is an idiot, and I use companions and guilt. Dude, what a waste of time! I, mean, I, <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Water was wet, like whatever. Dude. I know. It. Yeah. It's. It's. I was, I was about to, to answer destiny, though. I mean, what? What? Uh... Yeah, go make me a moral realist, or tell me why I'm not an anti-realist, or what, or explain um, what's the flaw in my position is. I guess I'm curious. No, not really. Um, I mean, I, I think I'm more. I think it's more interesting to see that um, the, the problem isn't really to know where moral facts will be located, like if they're in the universe, if they're in the head of humans. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not very important, I think. It's like mm -hmm. this question I asked you about mathematics, right? There, are, Where are our triangles? Obviously not in the physical universe. They exist as abstract entities in the mind. Yeah. Yes? Yes. And, but the question, like, if, if moral reasoning also exists in the mind, um, the next question is, can we say true things about it? Yes. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. True things about yeah. what? What do you mean by that? True things about it? About morality. For example, if I say, oh, friendship is valuable, can you argue against me? Is it possible to make reasonable arguments against this position or for this position? So I would be very wait, careful just, here. Just to get background here quickly, or, Destiny. Yeah. This is why I always have framed moral realism uh, as being things about truth value versus something objectively in the world. Oh my god, this is logic nerd shit. Sure, sure. You well, yeah, yeah. So, so what I would be careful to draw the distinction of is, is semantically you could sneak in a lot of baggage here, it feels. So, for instance, okay. if you were to say that um, friendship is good, that so it sounds like you're asking me, like, can I actually argue if friendship itself is good or bad? And I would say, well, what the sentence is actually saying is, is the idea... Is valuable. What? Valuable. Or valuable. Okay, sure, sure, valuable. Yeah. What I would say is we're not actually talking about friendship, really, because friendship itself doesn't exist. We're talking about the idea of friendship. And, and then what I would mean? say... I was always talking about an idea. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, I'm just making sure I'm being really clear. Sorry, just, just okay, so that yes. we're all on the same page. Yeah, we are on the same yeah so the idea of friendship is, um, is something that we can have a conversation about for sure. Um, and, and then you can make statements that are true or false relating to the idea of friendship, the same way you could with moral statements. This is why I think okay. I would be an error theorist. And, yeah. and, and we can have meaningful conversations about friendship, and we can say true and false things about friendships and things that are supported by facts and things that are unsupported by facts about friendship, right? Correct. Okay, well, well the thing is, like you said, friendship isn't something that's in the world. I mean, it is actualized in acts. For example, I can show you a friendly act. I can show you a mean act that's not friendly. Mm -hmm. But it's not friendliness itself, obviously, because that's, that's an abstract entity of the mind. Sure. 
yeah, or something else if you're a believer, but whatever. And the thing is, despite that um, this abstract entity isn't anywhere in nature, it means not, it's not located in the physical universe, we seemingly have the ability to talk about it and make meaningful, meaningful statements. Mm -hmm. And it's the same reasoning that I succinctly, sorry, talked about earlier when it comes to mathematics. For example, I can say a triangle has certain properties and my statement will be true, but it doesn't refer to anything in the world, right? Correct. And the same thing, I believe, can be done in ethics. And I, I do as well, yeah. So you see, you're not as much a moral anti-realist as Rem will, uh, will have said because a real, I mean a real, I mean a hardcore moral anti-realist will have said it's not possible to talk meaningfully about ethics at all because the words do not refer to anything. anything yeah, so isn't the technical definition of my stance, wouldn't I be considered an error theorist? Isn't that essentially well, what we're saying? It, it, well, actually, just, I, like the, I have the book really under my nose right now. Uh -huh. Yeah, Mackey. Of It's Mackey Ethics, Inventing Right and Wrong. And what's interesting is that he says in the very first 10 pages of the book, actually, is that it says, well, even though there are no moral facts in nature, because obviously facts aren't a property of the physical universe. Mm -hmm. They're queer. Let, let alone moral facts. He says, we can still meaningfully talk about it. And we, in fact, we are supposed to invent morality. Okay. So I, I'm not sure if you be an error theorist. Well, I because... thought the point behind error theorists was that error theorists say that moral fact isn't found in the natural universe, but we can still make it's meaningful more statements. Radical about... than that. It's more radical than that. You will go as far. An error theorist will, will say that um, uh, the term good, for example, doesn't mean anything at all, at all, at all, at all. So like it can't even refer to. So like I, so I would agree that not, good... not even to a mental state, not even to an emotion. Really? At, at best an emotion, but not even a mental state, not even a low and uh, not even a value. Nothing that can be meaningfully discussed. What's the difference between like an error theorist and a non-cognitivist then? Because that sounds like non-cognitivism. It's a branch uh, of non-cognitivism. Well, non-cognitivists think that moral statements, propositions don't have a true value. They are just like... Feelings. Some sort of... Well, yeah, an expression of fear, an expression of disapproval. Yeah, that sounds like what you're describing now then would be like non-cognitivism, no? Um, I think there's definitely overlap. Okay. But that's why I said earlier that it's not like super important. Sure. Yet. Well, I, I guess got... like um, because usually when I hear I'm people, I'm not a native English speaker, so I don't know the English labels too well. Oh I mean, sure. I mean, something else in something else in French. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so somebody that they're... believes that that moral ideas exist only in the mind, but we can still make meaningful statements about them, that person would still be a moral realist. Um. I think it's a weak form of realism. Uh, there's an author that me and Ren like, it's named Putnam, uh -huh. who argues something. I mean, um, he argues something that's basically internal realism. Uh, how can I explain that? I, I link uh, Destiny <clears throat> videos of Putnam uh, in chat, and I'm trying to slowly, subconsciously convert him. Um, it's very difficult, though. I mean, you have to be... It's a pretty difficult... Oh, put name, yeah. <laughs> I know. How can I, but... how can I talk about it? Okay, you see a truck, Destiny? Yeah. Do trucks exist in nature? Um, no. Okay, but they exist in the world. Um, well, so the concept of truck, it's an arrangement of things, but like, like if all humans... The way that I try to interpret this, you can tell me if this is right or wrong or bad or good, is that if all human beings were to disappear from, from the universe, like, the idea of a truck is, that that's like a form that, that is a universal form that humans invent. It's not actually anything. Oh my God, you've ruined this guy, Ren. What? Pardon? You've ruined him. He can't think without very complex problems. Well, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to be very clear. I'm just trying to be very clear so that I don't, I don't say something about me, right? Was, no, no, was, no, 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 but like, so yeah, so I would say something like trucks or yeah. trees, that these things, that when we say tree, what we refer to is an arrangement of potentially irreducibly complicated particles or whatever, but that the concept of a truck or a tree or a star aren't things that exist okay. in nature. It's just an arrangement that we have arbitrarily recognized as people. Right, right. so in, or, in order to refer to something in the world, we have to go through some concepts of our mind, right? Yes. Okay, so for example, if I don't think of a truck in particular, nor do I point to a truck, and I say, oh, um, I think trucks look nice. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that all the concepts I'm using in this sentence are in my mind. 
Um, Before the art of the world. Oh, yeah, let me think, right? So I'm using my correspondence memory to do this. So I think trucks look nice, right? Everything refers to a particular thing that... And or some... even I say trucks are red. Sure. Or trucks have wheels. You know, the concept of truck, the concept of wheel... Yeah, this is this is a meaningful truck. statement. Sure, th I would say these are meaningful statements, even if some of this doesn't... Okay. Yeah. Because you and me and everybody in, in, who's hearing us, hopefully, has roughly the same concept of truck and wheel, even though we have slightly different archetypes in mind, right? Mm -hmm. And well, so you see the, 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 um, this not referring directly thing, we do it all the time and it's not a big problem. Okay. This, this is what I talk about. But this is why I'm not a big fan of the correspondence theory, uh, Destiny. Wait, and why? I, I've been, well, because you know, ultimately, for for a statement to be true, it's I, I don't think it's necessary that it corresponds to something, you know, in the in the external world. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. so like, oh fuck, dude, I feel so uncomfortable correcting any statements made here because this is not my background, right? But what it feels to me is that correspondence theory um, w w would take issue with the linguistic way that that you talk about things. So, for instance, for somebody to say the truck is red, a correspondence theorist wouldn't necessarily say trucks have to be reducible to a real world thing that we recognize. They would say that, well, when he says trucks, he's referring to the concept of a truck or the universal form of a truck that is a mind okay, construct. Okay. Right? No. That, that means that means you have a concept that refers to a concept. So you never touch the world. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, because we can never touch the world, right? Well, but, but the correspondence there is just talking about something in the world. The current spendence fix you can touch the world. He well, is when it, he, it doesn't the correspondence theory say that we're just talking about the cons the idea of a truck which does exist in the world? No. No, you're talking about the world according yeah. to correspondence here. <laughs> really? I feel like that whole I read that whole Bertrand paragraph on it. I feel like that's not true. But but if you say it, I'll, I'll believe you. Okay. I, I thought that the correspondent theorist just meant that the it's the the statement is true as long as all of the propositions in the statement are corresponding oh, to something that is oh, true. Oh, actually, so in problems of philosophy, <clears throat> I, uh, yeah, that's a different thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, so okay, okay. My bad. In, I'm sorry. In problems of philosophy, I'm pretty sure Russell had a view like that. I, my Russell's not amazing here, but sure. uh, I'm pretty sure he adjusted his correspondence theory. Um, that's, that's a bit complicated because Russell yeah. had a logical and semantical project, but I yeah. basically correspondence is um. Oh, I don't. I'm not allowed to heat. Sorry. Um, <laughs> what you say must correspond to the world. Okay, so if if I say I'm eating olives. Uh, in the world, I'm eating olives, so it corresponds. It's true. Oh, okay. I would the, never believe in that. That sounds absolutely ridiculous because I don't know if we can ever gain uh, information about the external world, truly. Okay. So that means that in order to save correspondence, what we refer to must be something else than the actual world, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the thing is, so, I mean, right now, you're not a correspondence theorist anymore. And you've also agreed that we can talk meaningfully about abstract constructs. Correct. Things that don't exist in the in the natural world. Yes. Remember, Desi, this was the very objection when you asked when you asked me what what's the problem with correspondence theories. I I specifically pointed to things, that, you know, we want to talk about. You're, you're too technical. You bore people. No, 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 he doesn't bore. It. No, no, that's okay. Maybe then this no, guy just. Do you explained. not remember this is the exact objection I gave to you before, Destiny? I'm just bantering. <laughs> no, it's like okay. yeah, it's next. Um. I, I don't remember, but maybe I misunderstood it at the time or whatever. I'm not sure. Like, it's for fine. example, a fictional character. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to talk about a fictional character, and we can say true statements about fictional characters, even if they don't correspond to something in the world. Yeah, this is a statement that I believe we can do. This is why this is what I would compare my uh, my moral anti-realism to. That I would say, so like, I want to say, like, Harry Potter is a talented wizard. So I think that if I were to compare that, if I were to make that a moral <laughs> statement, I would say even though the Harry Potter universe doesn't exist, I can still make meaningful statements about it because we all agree on what the Harry Potter universe is or whatever, right? That right. Is, yeah. Interesting because the, the status of fictional characters, um, the way we talk about them is obviously different from the way we talk about real people. And it's funny to notice that it, it's this special status that allows for like nerdy debates, mm -hmm. such as who will win between Batman and Superman. Yeah, yeah, the, the power <laughs> level shit. Yeah. That was just an anecdote. Nerds love that kind of shit. Yeah. So anyway, the thing is that um, apparent you're more on the fence that you think you are, or that you've been told you are, because. You, you think there is some kind of truth in ethical statements that we can meaningfully discuss? And well, you're not a 
computers. Yeah, within the context, a- after you've assumed a bunch of things, yeah, there, there, there is. You can make some meaningfully true statements. Yeah. What do you mean assume? For for example. Um. Oh man, dude, this is we can we're going real deep. So like here, so here's something that I think I can say. Okay, I think oh, that, we can talk about something else if you're bored. Oh no no it's I mean, no 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 I'm not bored. I'm just these I concepts are like really really high level. He's for thinking me. hard. Yeah. Well, it's not that I'm thinking hard. It's that I might make a statement that's like not even wrong. Like I have such a bad foundation in it that I'm just making meaningless statements. Let's not be confident. Sure. Okay. Everybody's a okay. So like I think that I can make the statement um, trucks are red, and I think that that statement can be true. However. Okay that's nestled within the context of some assumptions that I cannot justify. So for instance, one assumption I've made is that there is an external world. I don't believe that I could ever truly justify that ever. I think that that's something that exists outside the bounds of my knowledge. However, given that I assume the external world is true, and given that I assume that my um, senses can accurately gather information about that universe, these are two things that I don't think I can ever justify or know about. But if I assume those two things, then I can make true statements about the universe. Okay, those are uh, epistemological norms. Yeah, okay, cool, okay, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Because you assume also the laws of logic, blah, 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 everything you need to make a meaningful statement. You need a toolbox. Correct, yeah, or would all be a priori assumptions that, so th- yeah, things like non-contradiction, all those memes, yeah. Okay, well, that's not a, that's not really a problem. Okay, yeah, wait, well, was there a problem? <laughs> well, there's no problem. I mean, you yeah, want to just kind of what we do. I don't. I don't see any any problems with your uh, with the way uh, you think about morality. Well, the problem is, <clears throat> is that now if you ask him, uh oh, <laughs> because if you if you ask him, for example, um, like I, I would say that Destiny, you're skeptical of us being able to arrive at any sort what? of moral truth. Okay, right. so here, let, here, I can actually give us, this is like the main problem that I have, the thing that I hate the most about morality, okay? So here's my problem with morality, okay? The thing that, yeah, the thing that I would want to be able to do with, with anything is I want to be able to argue with another person that I am correct and you are incorrect. So let's say, for instance, we're having a statement about the efficiency of a car engine, okay? We can appeal to some properties of the universe that we all agree on. So for instance, oh, no, you can't, you well, can't, there's a value statement there. Efficiency is a value statement. Sure. Well, yeah, no, you're already somewhat correct, right? Yeah, you're, 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 yeah, and even you're getting at the, the meat of my argument. Is I it see, like, I see what you mean. Yeah, I, I can never be- argue why my value statements are right and yours are wrong. I, I feel like, no, I feel like somebody like Kant would say, okay. well, no, I can make those arguments, but I, I can't, and I don't like that. Yeah, that's why I call myself an anti realist, because I can't argue these things to other people, whatever. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, but um, earlier you said that um, you believe you can meaningfully say things about stuff, uh, the stuff we we're talking about. So that means you believe in reasons mm-hmm. for why those things are true and not false. And the object of debate when you're talking about ethics with someone mm-hmm. is that you are supposed to examine those reasons, right? Oh, I mean, you can do otherwise if you're a philosopher. But in in practical situations, the way you're supposed to argue about ethics is to justify your claims, obviously. And sure, you can't verify them in the same way you can verify that all tracks are red, but you're supposed to argue with them analytically. Using yeah, but my problem is that, or go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say my problem yeah. is that like we can analyze uh, morals or ethics, but they have to be within the confines of some framework. And if people disagree on the framework to use, then we will never be able to meaningfully talk to another. So, for instance, say uh, somebody is, if somebody I, is religious, how how do I have a conversation of ethics with them when our value statements are necessarily different, and I can't justify okay. mine any more than they could justify theirs? I right, go. Ahead. Okay. So two things. Mm-hmm. First of all. It's true that in the case of religious people, there's a problem. And the reason is that they do not have the same epistemic norms as we do. Mm -hmm. For example, a a religious person may consider revelation to be something that's the source of valid knowledge. Whereas Uh I assume we don't like people in this conversation. Correct. But then my problem is I can't tell that person that they're wrong any more than they can tell me that I'm wrong. We're, We're on the same foundational level. That's my problem. Well, there are ways of arguing a person out of faith. Uh, it's to show them the non-coherence of faith, for example. Um, sure, but I mean, like, if you're familiar with arguing people with faith, they will always find ways to fit things within <laughs> to make them coherent, yeah, right? Yeah, um, well, two things. Yeah. So first, like I said, you can, you can say that their system is incoherent, as in self-contradictory. Right? Mm-hmm. And secondly, <coughs> sorry, uh, the reason why 
sometimes it's difficult to argue with people who are religious is for non-epistemic reasons. There's this really good book by Bachelard who, who that's titled uh, Formation of the Scientific Mind. And, and basically he talks about all the epistemic obstacles that exist in people and stop them from being what we would call nowadays rational, right? Okay. So for example, yes, uh, um, I don't know, trauma, uh, anger, whatever. It's much more subtle than that, but I'm lacking the clarity of mind to talk about it in sure. a very eloquent way. But the reason is that, the reason I'm talking about that is that religion can be considered an epistemic obstacle that needs to be overcome in like true Sure. Almost so like, but even at that, right, to, to, to throw back at you what you threw at me earlier, that desire for rationality, that's a value statement, right? Not really, because you can't, you can't uh, do anything outside of rationality. You're always already embedded into it. Um, like, are you talking you, about very no simple, you... basic a priori assumptions, like things like excluded middle and identity and non-contradiction or... Well, there is stuff like that, and there are more things like, uh, I don't know, these, in terms of the best explanation. These are the things that I mean when I talk about, like, necessary things for experience. Yeah, That's... but what I'm, what I'm curious is what possible necessary things for experience can exist that invalidate religious epistemology? That seems like a really hard sell to me. I would, if it's true, I would, like, that'd be awesome, but... Um... Like, it's what's like really an epistemic novel. norm that I could point to and go like, look at this epistemic norm. How could you possibly be religious? Like, how, what kind of uh, thing? Okay, well, you can argue by reductio, which is like what Aristotle does. Is like, uh, look, if you have those principles, then you end up accepting everything and that contradicts your other principles. Basically, it's, it's much more complex. And I think like in practical situations, if you want to argue against religious people, you have to go another route. Like you can't think themselves out of something that they haven't thought themselves in. Like yeah. the reason why you and me, Destiny, were able to have a productive conversation is because we share some values about productive discourse and you also were ready to engage your beliefs in, in a productive way. And so was I, blah, 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 blah. But with someone who's religious, um, I don't think rationality is the root at all because they're not in this roots in the first place i think you might have to circumscribe a claim you made earlier Nick. you said that we can't do anything that's kind of outside the boundaries of rationality but then you you kind of in, implying that religious people do something that's exactly outside of that so what's this realm of action or thought or i don't know discourse of rationality and what well is it? There are, there are two things. There are the norms in which you are locked in, right? Who are, I don't know, what will, what Chomsky will call the grammatic, the, the grammar of thought. Mm -hmm. And there, there are the rules that you follow and that you ascribe to, but which can at time contradict each other, right? And in fact, it always happens, like all the time. Our, we contradict what we do all the time. We are always being irrational, except when we go try really hard to be rational. When you, and, or go ahead. I was going to say, when you get a religious person that starts appealing to things like revelation or whatnot, on what grounds can you call that person irrational, I guess? Well, I think that's more of an issue for someone who will be a, a mental health professional, honestly. Even well, but like even let's go. So like here's like a thought problem that I have. OK, let's we can go a step deeper. Let's say you've got two people on yeah. an island and one person has a psychosis that causes them to hear a voice. Oh, at the, at, again. oh wait, my God. What? About experiments. Yeah, go ahead. Well, sure. Well, like I'm saying, like one person hears a voice at the other end of the island and the other person doesn't. Like these people can only rely on their senses to gather information about the world. There's no way that they could ever meaningfully agree or disagree on this proposition of their senses report different things, right? So if somebody claims that they're getting revelation through something, how can you ever, how could, how do you ever second guess that person? By, by what right can you do that? Well, you just use the norms of inquiry. I mean, just. It's not just, it's actually a huge deal. You just ask them, okay, wh why does this person come from? How well does it hold up to the other things you believe? Like, for example, you believe there is nobody else on the island. Mm -hmm. So how, how does the voice come from? I mean, usually voices come from people and there's nobody here. So where does it come from? And then boom, this person adds a, an ad hoc explanation that says, oh, we must come from a supernatural being. And then it contradicts another principle they have, which is to not make ad hoc explanations. So you have two contradictions already? Wait, wait, wait. What principle? Do not make what? Uh, uh, ad hoc hypothesis. You know what that is? Oh, ad, ad hoc? 
Yeah, ad hoc. So oh, sure. I mean, yeah, I, I understand. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. I only speak one language, so don't worry. <laughs> um, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but like, th like it almost sounds like you're uh, almost appealing to like an uh, an Occam's razor as like a rule of law here, which isn't necessarily true, right? Like the person could say like, well, maybe somebody appears or somebody is invisible and, and makes a, a shouting voice or whatever, right? Uh, like, no, like um, people always follow Occam's razor, and when they don't, they're in bad faith and they know they're not, unless they're pathologically irrational. You... I was going to jump okay. in and say it seems more like a verification or confidence thing. Like, you take all the facts you can observe about the island, and you don't hear the voice, right? But this guy is saying, I hear a voice, it's from the heavens. Mm -hmm. But from all sort of, like, the facts you can gather, you might infer that he's a bit mentally ill, sugar his other behaviours, and you have, like, a varying confidence in his statements. So that's seems what you would use these what next calling a norm of inquiry to give confidence or disconfidence to a statement. I guess the thing that bothers me is, is that at the end of the day, like both people would have their own systems where they would reasonably feel like they are internally justified and they would reasonably feel like the other person is the one that's incorrect. And I don't see how... Well, the thing is that they have a big overlap between their systems. Okay. And the one who reinforces as an incurrent system because he's holding two things that are contradictory. So the other person needs to show, to point that. That he's hearing. I mean, one thing yeah. which the Ford experiment lacks is it's only two people. And an argument between two people usually devolves into, I'm right, fuck off. But, you know, when you do like a scientific or an academic inquiry, you have more than two people there typically. So it might just be that the Ford experiment is framed a bit wrong in epistemic terms. Gotcha. I, yeah, I mean, I use two people to simplify it to get to the heart of the matter. But I guess if we were to go to like more people um, in the in the world, I guess you would have a lot of religious people and a lot of scientific. Ugh, I had to use that word, but like a lot of normal people, a lot of rational people. I don't like to use that one either. But um, I just don't know how you ever settle disputes between these two huge groups of people because they both have their convictions that ultimately become circular. Uh, like when you, you talk about things like revelation, you check for contradiction all the time. Gotcha. When, when you argue with someone and you think they're wrong. You check for a contradiction. And you I mean, I, I can with a reasonable person, but if it's with a religious person, I, get, and getting into contradiction, if anything, causes me to lose well. the argument. Because when it, com when it comes to contradiction, you've got to be like fully informed of their system. So, for instance, if I try to argue... Oh, yeah. Yeah, if That'd I try to argue contradiction with like a religious person and I say like, well, what about this or this? Then they'll say, oh, well, this is actually explained by this text or well, this is yeah. actually explained by this one. It's like, oh, well, fuck me. I guess you're the right. Thing, then. The thing with arguments is that is that it's like arguing is a setting, right? It's mm -hmm. um, it's not something it's not like a conversation about what kind of, I don't know, music you like. Uh, you have to follow certain rules. You need to be in good faith. You need to be honest. You need to be respectful. You need to follow certain norms of knowledge, blah, blah, blah. So if the person yeah. you are discussing with uh, doesn't follow these rules, it's not going to be an argument in the first place, right? Um, and when you're talking with a believer who does follow these rules that you agreed uh, upon, whether it is explicitly or implicitly, mm -hmm. you can check for contradiction in, in a healthy way. Uh, I go to a lot of public debates and I've argued with Salafists and they're horrible people, but whenever they are trapped in the rules of a debate, you can um, block them against the wall with contradictions. And if there's an audience that will hold them accountable for their contradictions, it's even better. Where the fuck do you find this audience? Because <laughs> it's not on Crap. YouTube <laughs> or politics. Oh, God. Well, no, it's, pre it's pretty bad. Like the state of public discourse, um, you know, imposes. Is that a, is that a word? Impose? Yeah. yeah, imposes. Imposes um, material conditions which, which make discussion is really difficult like yeah. for example me i'm convinced that oral discourse is like super good because you can easily figure out where you disagree and where you don't disagree but most people are not very good interlocutors for the good reason that nobody's teaching them to be good ones mm -hmm. and obviously they can figure it out by themselves yeah. because it's difficult yeah so the, one of the reasons why like earlier you said okay but i have no method to deal with ethical problems okay but actually actually you do it's the same method you will use to argue, for example, against someone who will have a terrible scientific method. You know, someone who will say uh, something crazy such as, um, we must prioritize the the, the, the hypothesis that are less supported by the facts. Sure. You know? 
And you you will argue, you could argue against this person. Of course, it, it will require you to be smart. Yeah, and them to be arguing in good faith and whatnot, right? Yes, and you need those rules, etc. But you can meaningfully have ethical discussions. But it's difficult. It requires skill. It requires the rule of discourse to be set. Mm -hmm. So you need a, a setting, and you need to be competent. And not everybody is. Sure. But if you are a very good interlocutor uh, yourself, you can usually like bring your interlocutor, the, the person you're talking to, to a certain level of thought. Okay, cool. I want to try this with you then. Sure. You, what do you want to discuss? Okay. Wait, wait, what, wait. one thing before, because yeah. this is falling exactly along this line. <clears throat> I'd ask you, Neck. Um, yeah. Do you know that? Have I, you know, Bogosian? What? Bogosian, B O G H O S S I A N. Uh, that rings a bell, but I'm not sure what it is. Like, um, who it is. It's an author. Paul Bogosian. I think he's the silver yeah. professor at New York University. He's, yeah. He's philosophy of logic, dude. Uh, he wrote this paper yes. in New Essays on the A Priori, and he basically says that, you know, if we try to justify something really simple like modus ponens, um, yeah. it is absolutely impossible to, uh, you know, prove the A Priori nature of Wow, well, you know who else said the exact same thing 200 years ago? Kant. And that you haven't read? Who? <laughs> Fucking Aristotle, dude. <laughs> two thousand years ago, not hundreds. Whatever. Two thousand years. Metaphysics, ago. metaphysics, beta, dude. I I keep telling you to read the fucking book, and you won't. Look, I've and got I... a fuck ton of books to read. Okay, I have to prioritize. It's, it's the most important book. If you had read this one, there'd be so many other books you wouldn't need to read. He says it's in the refutation of Protagoras. He says if you argue against some things, you can't argue against them because they're so prior, blah blah blah. But you undermine the very conditions of yeah, your counter yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm very much aware of this. I'm like, it, that sounds very Wittgensteinian to me as well. It's um, Aristotelian, I'm gonna beat I, you up. Did, wait, Wittgenstein didn't read Aristotle, so really, they're both original. You no, know, it's because I told you. <laughs> that is Aristotle shilling aside, can I just jump in before Destiny and Neck do their little discussion thing? You can jump in any time. We already agreed yeah. that interrupting each other implicitly was polite. So go ahead. Right, so Destiny said what I think was like an important thing, but... I think the girls are for losers, by the way. Yeah. What? <laughs> no, I ge yeah. genuinely didn't hear you, I wasn't listening. I, I said anime girls are for losers. Oh, uh-oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well... Anyway, so Destiny said that one thing that needs... kind of needs to happen is somebody needs to be reasonable, right? And it kind of... when you are explicating on like the virtues and kind of obligations you have in an argument, that's kind of what being reasonable is, right? And one yeah. move you can make, which you'll recognize, because we talked about it in roles and kind of like pragmatism to a large extent, is you don't have any sort of epistemic duties other than very thin ones, like not lying to them and not confusing them intentionally to unreasonable people. So I think if you focus on reasonability, that's a relatively like objective concept, right? No, when you say no reasonability, person. I just want to make sure we're being crystal clear. So I understand. When you say reasonability, you're basically saying, like, follow arguments to their logical deductive conclusions, right? That, like, that's it. You're not, not any broader than that? or It's kind of like um, a sort of a regular sort of thing. Um, what do we need in order for this discussion to work out as we want? Like, when we enter into a public argument, mm -hmm. we have shared aims. Like, we want to get as close to the truth as possible. You want it to be productive. Okay. We don't want to marginalize anybody. This is there. so 100%. Okay. This is so what? This is Dewey. Well, it's Dewey. It's Dewey. like Rosie and liberalism, whatever. But yeah, that standard, it seems to me, is, you know, that's an objective epistemic norm of being reasonable. And then that kind of obliges everybody to act in a certain way for the sake of this thing to work. Otherwise, you know, you've just wasted your time in a big way. But uh, again, I would, so going back to that Bogosian thing, it, for example, I know you bring up Aristotle and that, you know, you're refuting the very thing you're using to argue. It's, it's the whole, you know, you can't prove, can't prove, um, you can't disprove deductive logic by using deductive logic, right? That's like, not the point. Well, what is the point then? 
you what can't escape it. You can't escape it anyway. You are always inside it. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. So again, you could say all this, but if you completely, if we do what ask yourself does, and we say, well, that's just like I reject, um, I reject real circularity. I reject that I'm always within. I reject these necessary conditions. Right. It's what is the solution there? Do we you say no? You're lying to yourself. You check for contradiction always. But but if you but again if you're talking to someone like ask yourself who will say oh well contradiction is something within your axiomatic system it's a logical uh, if they don't if they don't accept contradiction that means they accept everything therefore you are entitled right to and you get bad company but if you say that that is not a, again you can you you have the ultimate skeptic. Who is gonna try to? Well, yeah, but we never there. worry about we never worry about talking to the ultimate skeptic, right? But but that's nope. exactly the people you talk to, Destiny. No, I wouldn't say that. Ask yourself as the ultimate no, skeptic. No, just because you just because you say Destiny, that you don't. He's just an idiot. No, he's no, not. I... Don't be me too. Oh no, he is an idiot. No, no, <laughs> he's an idiot. But I wouldn't say he's the ultimate skeptic because the ultimate Always skeptic. The ultimate idiot. I've met worse. <laughs> sure. Well, no, no, because, because he... the ultimate skeptic, I don't think, would further an argument for literally anything because they would say everything is literally epistemological nihilism, if that's even like a real phrase. But they would say like literally nothing is anything. <laughs> that's what you can go. He always says, uh, so whenever I try to give my position, he is the ultimate skeptic in that if what I start talking argue about with the guy or rule circularity, he says, well, you know, rule circularity and contradiction are just an axiom that you're using within your system. Just, just, you do logic, right? Just fucking do EFQ. X falso quad libet. You say, okay, all axioms are equal well, value. Then you posit yours that contradicts him and you trample him. And then you show by action. Oh, that it's a of explosion. Yes, but again, if, if you, yeah, and that's what I've said. And he, and this is the point that he refused. And then he's not yes. entitled to arguing against you. That means he has yes, self being unreasonable. Right. Of course, he, of course, he's being fucking unreasonable. But is would you not agree that the solution to someone who will accept the principle of explosion and you know accept the principle? No, of, uh, stop. You're not doing justice to his argument. This is not. How fair. am I not? He says that all axiomatic systems are assumed, and there's no way. Well, to but that's true. No, no, act, no, no. <laughs> See, this is what I'm talking about, Nick. It's that... more, it's more, now, I see what you mean. Um, the disagreement yes. here is that you can just posit any axiom. Okay. Right. Axioms yeah. are not. Axiom isn't the code word for thing you don't have to prove. Okay. It's something that you accept if your community of inquiry already agrees that it's true. Okay. Like if there is a disagreement about an axiom, it can't be an axiom. The reason why there there was a mathematical crisis in the last century was because there was a disagreement about the axioms. And there are good reasons for being in disagreement. Like, so if someone walks up to you and says, oh, your axioms are shit, you are not magically sheltered from disagreement. Yeah, I and I agree with that depending upon what your um what your axioms are, right? So like for instance, like I can't have an axiom that says, you know, we ought to um, you know, fund video game development, right? That this is something that would be like way too lower level that would require more justification. But like an yeah. axiom that re relates to um fuck, I don't even know what an what an what some sort of like something like we shouldn't murder people. I don't know. Is that can that be an axiomatic statement or is that still too broad? That's too broad still. Um, okay, give me an example of an axiomatic, like something related to morality, I guess. Non-necessary suffering is undesirable. Okay, sure. There we go. Okay. So like, wait, what was my original point? <laughs> You're talking about axiomatics and the way they're differently justified. Oh, yeah. Okay. Th that, that statement in and of itself... <clears throat> It doesn't have a justification, right? Or is, is necessarily unjustified. So if somebody disagrees with it, you can't say anything more than, well, that's just my axiomatic statement, right? Well, thinking about justification in this case doesn't even make sense because the axioms you posit epistemologically are the ones who define what the fuck justification is. That's like being in piano arithmetic and saying, oh, well, addition isn't defined in those. I mean, addition isn't contained in those. Yes, because it defines addition, right? The very concept of justification can only come after the axioms. Okay, right, so but... how how is it that if somebody would disagree with that statement, you say that um, more or less what, what we should uh, maximize minimize the suffering of of consciousness or something, right? If they think that, they will contradict themselves. It, so if they disagree with that statement, they'll necessarily contradict themselves. How do you say that? Necessarily, because the rules of logic make it so. The rules of logic make it so that we must minimize the suffering of other creatures. Yes. How? Oh, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I would love to, because it sounds like that sounds like some sick okay. shit. <laughs> so, yeah. So, 
so basically uh, okay wait just so i understand what we're about to get into okay i'm real excited this is true you're saying that if i accept some fundamental rules of logic which i probably do that i will yes. necessarily also, also some facts about the world Okay, and then some facts about the world that I will necessarily logically arrive at the statement um, that we ought to. Or, well, sure. How, how do you think we kids we, we teach kids morality? That's the exact way we teach morality. Well, I would say we do it from an arbitrary point of view that is unjustified. I would say that all of our teachings of morality are, are unjustified necessarily. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I, I. Yes, because there's this um, in English morality also works for mores. I'm not talking about cultural relativity of morality, such as you know societal norms, stuff like that. I'm talking about pure rational beauty, okay? Stuff that you can actually meaningfully discuss in the way we talked about earlier. Okay, yeah, go for it. I want to hear you get there from ra from rational statements. Okay, you can we can take any ethical disagreement between it, between us, okay. and we can I'll show you that we can meaningfully discuss it. Okay. Okay. So what what I mean? Oh, the, okay. Is this is a great segue into what I wanted to discuss earlier. Then okay, before we got off into everything. So what yeah, I was that's, I've been yeah. trying to come back in, in the, to it. So what I was going to ask you was are you a vegan i am fuck all right oh never mind uh that was my home i'm not no no we can still do it how come you agree with me um uh, i don't i'm not a vegan but i but i think i have okay, so why are you not um because i'm not concerned with the well-being of conscious creatures okay are you you're not no why don't you kill yourself well, I'm only concerned with maximizing my own preference. So, okay, you're ready to cringe? So I think that I'm a descriptive egoist. I don't know if I'm quite an ethical egoist, but I would say that people function in a way well, that- Well, that's, that's a lot of big words, Destiny. You're gonna have to explain so, yeah, it to me. Fuck off, okay? I'm just trying to be clear, okay? So what I would say is that every creature functions in a way that maximizes, well, no, no, let me be very clear. People mm -hmm. will try to satisfy their preferences and that that's how people function and that satisfying your preferences isn't necessarily maximizing the well-being of, of other people. will try people. to satisfy their, pre their, pre their, pre their yeah. preferences? Yes. No matter what? Um, yes. Okay, so that means that every act person does is to satisfy their preferences. Correct. So your criteria means nothing because it doesn't Because it's vacuous? The... Yeah, I understand. That's a contention that you can have with it. But let's ignore it. <laughs> I don't know. We can't ignore it. It's huge. <laughs> Um, so the problem with the problem with the, yeah the problem with ethical egoism is that ultimately you can argue it's vacuous because everybody will of course satisfy their preferences because by definition that's what you do with preferences right yeah well you can define preferences in this way but you know in in reality preferences are weaker in in the logical sense right because we do shit that we do not prefer all the time. Yeah, because but then my argument is that it's because level. you have a higher level uh, preference or whatever right so yeah. like for instance like the guy okay, okay. that yeah go ahead. You notice how then you have two meanings of preference, immediate preference and posterior preference? Um, okay, sure. So the thing is starting to collapse already. Well, it's not collapsing. We're just better defining it. <laughs> so, um, well, okay, yeah, sure. Okay. I disagree, but I see your point. Sure. Um, what is... So that means there are two different uh, egoisms, okay? Okay, Egoisms sure. about posterior preferences, egoism about immediate preferences. Um, egoism is about... Wait, I'm sorry, could you, say, could you repeat that phrase again? So we just made a distinction between two different kind of preferences, right? Yeah. So there are preferences in the long term, preferences in the short term. Correct. Okay. So people always follow their preferences. Which ones? Long ones, short ones. Um oof. So I feel like what I would argue is that there is a higher level of preference here that determines which preference you follow. <laughs> okay. Wait, so here actually which one would you so say a they preference follow? Of preference. What? You know what this preference of preference is called? What? A moral rule, dude. The <laughs> moral rule? Um, okay, so let's say, for instance, okay, so this might be correct. So, or, or, or well, if you say it, I assume it's correct. So, like, let's say, for instance, let's talk about um, short term preference versus long term preference. Let's say that a long term preference is being healthier and a short term preference is um, is is pain and suffering. So, somebody might value a long term preference. It's like the same thing to me. Being healthy just means not suffering. Um, no, no. Well, what's no. the diff what, what does healthy mean to you? Um, I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm going to speak within the specific example of exercising, right? So exercising is something that is generally seen as is not pleasurable. We'll ignore edge cases or whatever, but like generally, exercising is something that requires work. It's not pleasurable. It causes okay, some. I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just because I'm a radical, I am against thought experiments. Usually, okay. when I talk about ethics, I would like my. I mean, you're not. You don't have to oblige to this. Sure. But I like my interlocutor to use examples from their lives or mine. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, not using that. I'm using exercising, like literally exercising. So exercising so something. Your, so that's your opinion about exercise, right? Okay, sure. Okay, so I don't generalize it. Sure. So I'll say that, gener that exercising you is. Know that you, don't, 
you don't have to do this. I'm just asking you as a courtesy. You know? Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, that exercising is generally not a fun thing to do. That there are other more preferable things to do, or or, so you or eating healthy. Like exercise. What? You dislike exercise. Sure. Yeah. Yes, okay. but that it produces a long-term desirable outcome, that you have a long-term preference that's satisfied there, even if a short-term one isn't necessarily. Such as being healthy. Yeah, versus... So it's worth it to work out what? because you get to be in good health. So it's worth it to work out because you get to be in good health, despite the fact that it's unpleasant. Um, well, that you would have to determine that, I guess. Whatever ultimate preference you appeal to would, would have to make that determination, right? You think there are people who prefer not being healthy? Um, yes. yes, kind of. I yes. like I, I because don't because out. there are people that are more concerned with say not exercising or eating unhealthy foods or whatever than they are with the long term preference of being healthy. Yeah. Sounds like a conflict of preference then. What do you mean by exercise? Like, does going for like a daily walk? Oh my god! Exercise? No, yes, this is irrelevant. This is irrelevant. Yeah, this is irrelevant. I think. No, it isn't because I like I, for example, I don't really care about. Okay, here like, let, let's make it more broad. What we're saying is that there are some love. There are some actions that we can generalize that would produce an amount of suffering or pain that would produce a long-term positive, like being healthier. If going on a walk is enjoyable for you, then clearly I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about something that would like say like running on a treadmill for an hour or lifting a heavy weight or something, right? Resistance training. But these are things that are generally non. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, keep going. I'm listening. Yeah, so so I, I guess it feels like there's some sort of ultimate preference that that weighs these things. And you're saying that by me saying there's an ultimate preference, I'm really just linguistically redefining morality. Right? Uh, no, I, will, I wouldn't go that far. But that means that you're pointing at a structure behind behind preferences mm -hmm. that seems to be the same of the same nature as of one of the principles we talked about earlier in Bentham. You remember? Which is? Uh, which one was it called? Uh, hold on. Uh, Fecundity. Wait, wait so say that again? Like, fecundity. So like I work out, it's unpleasant, but it's going to produce good conditions in the future. Oh. Yeah. Do it. Yeah, this is this is what you were talking about with the uh, different ways of measuring utility, and one of the ways is on a time horizon. Is that what yeah, you were? That's one of the yes. Yeah. Okay, catch it. I remember. Okay, cool. Okay. So that seems like a, it. It sounds like a principle. And so it sounds like people abide by a principle that's more complex than just preference. Be advised. Even if they... The or, sorry, like, again, I, I'm, I'm confused here because I don't feel like exercise is a good example. Um, I think exercise is the perfect example. You're a lazy fuck. <laughs> no, it's just that I, I know a lot of people you that... Work out. It's good for your body. Uh, like, people will readily... Uh, accept a like what, what do we say to people who are obese and are, are fine about it like they'll readily accept a a lesser lifespan and possibly a poor quality of health because they enjoy eating food I mean we can argue about that but I think it's gonna take us another route than the one we were trying to go to so are we just saying for the because I, I don't that's why I don't think exercise is the best example because I can imagine okay I don't, we'll talk about look at America <laughs> I mean well, no, no, this is the perfect example. That's why I'm saying that some people value some preferences over than other, that not everybody necessarily has the, the, the I guess, the, the, that they don't think that satisfying some short-term preferences, like, is, they, they would say that satisfying a short-term preference is preferable than the long, to the long-term one, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I just, I don't, so we're, we're saying that, are, are we trying to say that everyone has this long-term preference of... Oh my god, you are drifting us into useless technicalities, dude. I, I, I don't know, but how is this useless? It's useless because we're trying to make the point of whether everybody uh, is an egoist or not. Yeah, so, but in order to do that, I feel like we have to have an adequate example. And I don't- I feel like exercise is like, we can use eating if you want. Would that be a good one? Yeah, I think eating is a perfect example. Okay, okay. then let's just say eating then. So okay. I could eat a chocolate cake right now, or I could eat a vegetable stew. The vegetable stew will produce a longer positive outlook for me. The The chocolate cake will make me fat and give me diabetes and I'll die sooner. But so, but a lot of people will opt towards the latter rather than the former or whatever. Why? Yeah. Yeah. So some so there must be some ultimate preference that somebody is satisfying with, without... Yeah, okay, go ahead. So they're applying, they're, they're applying some sort of mental evaluation of whether it's worth it or not to eat the cake, right? And in fact, we do this constantly. Mm -hmm. For example, before like Rem asked me to join this conversation, I made a calculus, like, should I go to sleep to be fresh in the morning or should I have this chat? And then I decided to come here, okay? But you see, I made this decision ignoring things about my future, obviously. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know how the composition was going to go. I don't know you. I, I don't know if you were going to be agreeable or not. I don't know if I'm going to get a headache in the morning because I drank alcohol. There's so many things I ignore. 
Sure. And it's like oh, I mean, the uncertainty. Me? That was another utilitarian weighing thing from that one guy, right? Bantham. Bantham. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. And the thing is that I, I I used a value that I have is that I enjoy philosophical conversations. Mm -hmm. So I use the value there. And values are not preferences. It's more complicated. Don't you have a preference for a value, <laughs> or is this becoming really vacuous? Is this like a really stupid? Values are values are um, order of importance, right? You can think of values as a list of things uh, on which, of which the top are the most valuable and the bottom are the less valuable. So, for example, if you are someone that values friendship more than uh, I don't know romantic relationships, you're gonna you're gonna order your life in a certain way. Where does that value but, come from though? Oh, it come from it can come from a lot of things. It can be socially received, it can be taught, it can be examined for a reason, it can be religious, it can be due to personal preferences, it can be justified or unjustified. Doesn't all of these things uh, and again, I'm not trying to say, if this is like really dumb or vacuous, you could tell me, but it feels like don't no, all, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, don't all of these things ultimately just reduce to a preference? So for instance, when you say like, well, it could be a societal pressure, um, well, sure, so you develop a preference to follow society's pressure or it could be religious pressure, sure, you follow. Well, some values some values are entirely subjective and therefore can be meaningfully discussed mm -hmm. and some other values are not. For example, epistemic values can be discussed and everybody has the same ones, roughly. Uh, there are other values such as, I don't know, which food we like or which kind of music we like, which can't, can't be meaningfully debated because we are entitled to them in a way. We can talk about them in a meta way. For example, oh, those values are such, like, like so and so. Mm -hmm. But I can't say that you're wrong for liking Holiday on Ice unless I am appealing to non to other values such yeah, but... as, you know, this, this show is bad because it promotes, I don't know... The bad work ethic. I don't know something like that. Yeah, that's what it feels like. If you were, if you were to talk to somebody, the only way you would be able to convince them is to appeal to another preference. So, for instance, if somebody says, "I like this thing," and you go, "Well, you shouldn't like that thing," you go, "Well, why not?" You would have to appeal to a, a preference that you think they should be weighing higher that they haven't considered before. So, for instance, if I say, um, if someone says, "I like Chris Brown music," and and they and then you go, "Well, no, you shouldn't like it," and they go, "Well, why?" and you go, "Well, because that guy is a woman abuser, and I know that you hate people that abuse women," and they go, "Oh, okay, right. sure, you've changed their." What? Preference. You're doing right yeah. now is uh -huh. checking for contradiction, like I said earlier. Sure. And the thing is that you're trying to show that some values the person holds are contradictory. Mm -hmm. For example, that's that's what usually people who are vegan do to people who are not vegan. Yeah, that's what I would do in an argument with a carnist. Yeah, you would say that's, that you value this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the people, this the person um, that you're talking to can own the contradiction and say, "Well, I don't care about being contradictory. I'm a hypocrite." Mm -hmm. But then you are rented in, in, into, you know, not listening to them at all and dismissing their opinion. You know, they have they have uh, forfeited their rights. Yeah, to the because by the moral. principle of explosion, everything they say is essentially worthless if they Absolutely. admit to contradictions. Sure. Right. So if um, basically it's not merely about preference, people also guide their lives according to principles, decisions epistemic values, stuff like that. And besides, there's the empirical fact that people do selfless shit all the time. But the thing is that uh, we don't well, and then, so to be clear, like the, the way that I look at both of these things, I guess, right now is when you say people value different preference where people have different values that they follow, I would say it's because they have a preference for said values. And then um, be, be, and then you're saying um, people do selfless things. And I would say it's because they have a preference for those selfless things that stem from some values. I, I guess to make it feel like it's not like super ultimately vacuous because it because it does sound like what I'm saying means nothing. But I guess like the kind of greater thing I'm getting at is that it feels like literally every single moral system you could ever have is essentially just justified post hoc because what you do is you find conclusions that you like and then you'll always find a moral system to justify it like for, for instance if somebody had a, uh, I disagree you disagree so so what it feels like to me and then you can tell me if I'm wrong or how I'm wrong or give an example if somebody had a moral system and all of a sudden that moral system started to generate a whole bunch of answers that they found non-preferable they would abandon that moral system immediately do you think that's true okay, or not true? Well, yeah but that, that's a belief you have because you've only met shitty persons okay can you can you uh, give me an example of something where that's not true well, me, uh, I, um, I fucking hate being a vegan, dude. I fucking hate it. I love meat and I just love cooking and I like having people at my place. And before Wait, you like I was cooking, no, he cooking. said meat, cooking. Oh, oh, cooking. 
And before I was a vegan, I was I always had friend over, blah blah blah, and we threw parties and stuff. I love having I, I love being a host, you know. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm a vegan, it's more complicated, and parts of my life has tanked from it. But I still do it out of duty because I am rationally convinced that it's the right thing to do, and I take pleasure from it. It's true, but I also take displeasure from it because I'm forfeiting a pleasure that I liked being eating meat, like merguez. I fucking love merguez. Sure, but like you know? let's say, but like let's say that um w- wouldn't okay. So two things. One, wouldn't I argue here? Well, okay. It sounds to me like your the pleasure that you derive out of being um out of being ethically consistent exceeds whatever pleasure you would get out of eating meat. So obviously you would choose that over the other. Okay, but let check. Let's let's look at the comparison you're doing. Here. Okay. Like the pleasure we get from eating meat is like a sensory pleasure, right? Sure. We eat. feels good, but the pleasure I get from not killing animals. It's not something that I feel in my body in any way. It's oh. not comparable to eating meat at all. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, maybe this is, uh, so are you a materialist or do you believe that something different happens with the mind or whatever? Or I don't, maybe we this don't, is- We don't have to make that argument. Okay, I'm we don't even need to, okay. So I, I would argue that both of these reduce to pleasurable states in the brain, that being uh, being consistent or morally consistent okay, or something. Well, uh, I don't want to bore you with like psychiatry, but that's not true. It's not the same circuit. It's not the same chemistry, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it, I mean, like, I, I mean, it's obviously not the exact same as like a play. So for instance, like the feeling of love you might have for a significant other is going to be different than the feeling of an yeah. orgasm. But, but I would argue that ultimately these are things that we can choose in the brain, right? That that you would have you a mean? preference. So for instance, like um, like the, the pleasure of an orgasm is going to be different than the pleasure of love you might feel from a significant other, but a person yeah, might yeah. still... But, but if a person chooses to, say, um, buy a hooker and cheat on their loved one with a, with a prostitute, that they're valuing one of those pleasures more than the other one, that they have, they're have they using um, their, their preferences for one over the other, no? Okay, well, that's an interesting example. Um, I work on gloomy topics such as sexual violence and suicide. Mm-hmm. And an interesting pattern is that people, um, well, criminals in general, do things that they do not prefer constantly. Um, And one way to think about it is to say that either they're being irrational or they're being stupid or they make terrible judgments. So for example, someone, um, one of the classic examples in criminology is people who rob stores. It's a terrible calculus, right? Because you don't get a lot of money from robbing the store successfully. And if you get caught, Mm -hmm. you're going to get a shit ton of time in jail. So it's not a good calculus, even if you have a value of risking a lot. Yeah. Let people do it all the time. Yeah. So this is something that I have. I, so I actually talk about this a lot on stream because we do a lot of politics. And this is where I would say something like um, these people are making decisions, but they're really just yeah. stupid in the way they're making the decision. So, for instance, I think that politically, a lot of people would come together on a lot of different issues if they mm-hmm. all were rationally minded. So, for instance, in the United States, uh, um, this is maybe slightly controversial. I'll point to something like a social health care system that most people have the same values. For instance, they want the most amount of people covered by health care in an affordable way as possible but that some people are too stupid to see that a one way is better than the other so they choose another option that doesn't necessarily okay. mean that they're not satisfying the, the preference of feeling like they're doing the right thing or whatever but that they're just kind of like misinformed or, or dumb their higher cognitive process is broken i guess okay yes that's uh i think you're being a bit harsh here i just think it essentially often boils down to insufficient information well, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, I say stupid, but yeah, we'll say insufficient information. Sure, but I would argue uh, the same thing with the criminal there, where the criminal is trying to satisfy a preference, but they have insufficient yeah. information to evaluate whether or not robbing a store is truly like an intelligent act. If the if the ex- right. expected value is positive or negative, um, the same goes for people who commit extremely heinous acts, such as, of course, rape, mm-hmm. but of, also for people who destroy themselves. You know, um, for example, the act of self harm mm-hmm. is usually something that's supposed it's done pathologically you know you, you don't really realize why you're doing it i'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm speaking for most cases here obviously sure. there are a shit ton of anecdotic evidence um so the rationale behind it is that as you hurt yourself you are in control of the suffering that you are um experiencing mm-hmm. likewise killing yourself is an act that's i mean i'm, I'm not i'm actually not going to talk about this example because it's too wide okay but those three extreme examples, robbing a store, committing uh, an, an innocent act of torture, such as rape or self-harming, I think are examples of situations in which the person is not driven by the calculus at all. They're not driven by their preferences, not even subconsciously. 
I don't. I don't know if I agree with that, especially in the case of killing yourself. Um, well, I, I was well, he it, wanted it, to it, stray from that. Oh, one. oh, I think you cut off for me there. Then okay, fair because enough. Because it's more complicated because it implies seizing your own existence. Yeah, exactly. A complicated topic. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, another thing I wanted to say pertaining to egoism is that uh, obviously it can be post hoc rationalization of what we do. Like mm -hmm. you know the principle of sufficient reason, blah blah blah. We look at things we've done, and we're always going to find motivations bust hoc for them. Mm -hmm. right? Oh, of course, I did this because this. I did this because this. Blah, blah, blah. blah. But there are also situations in which you can see that uh, we had no really real reason to do that. And in fact, it's, most of my life-defining events were kind of absurd, actually. Most of you your life... Wait, can you say that again? I didn't understand. My life-defining events were kind of absurd. Your life-defining events? Yes. Oh, gotcha. Okay, okay. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, I'm not. I'm kind of tired. No, no, it's I'm fine. Also... It's fine. And also, uh, obviously, the last example is that you can do selfless shit all the time. For yeah. example, me, uh, I'm a teacher, and I can tell you that there is um, perceived qualitative difference in my mind and in my mental state between doing things that I prefer and doing things out of duty. But I think that the egoist position has a lot of value because obviously a lot of people just live by that. But it doesn't mean that everybody has to. It's not a necessary truth, you know, so to speak. It's some kind just of anthropological phenomenon mm -hmm. that people obviously will follow their preferences. I guess the reason why I feel like... Yeah, I feel like the reason why there's value in in the egoist analysis is that, um, and and again, maybe I'm redefining too many things away. But like you say that you feel some that, that so the way that I would analyze you is I would say that you have some preference for for um, adhering to a duty over fulfilling more short term preferences. Is that if I understand you to act in that way, and I was trying to create a better society, then my goal would be to establish environments where people are set up to prefer some sort of duty system over an immediate fulfillment thing. That 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 because I can analyze it in that way i could produce better outcomes as a result of that analysis but maybe these these, these don't even necessarily um, contradict what you're saying i guess well i don't think so i think it's quite compatible mm -hmm. um it's just that i think um the egoist view is not very helpful to understand human behavior you know it's like like we said it's vacuous it doesn't say a lot of things about motivations Oh, okay, I feel I feel the exact opposite. I'm um so like I yeah I think I just pretty much said it that like understanding that everybody has some internal set of preferences that they try to fulfill. Your goal would be to change those preferences in ways that benefit all of society. That would be the goal. Okay, but look, the thing is that if uh -huh. you just say of someone that oh they did this thing because they preferred it, you're uh -huh. not saying anything. It's it's like the scholastics did uh, during the medieval era. Oh, this is wet because it has a wet quality. Well, big shit, dude. It doesn't well, I actually. Think, well, the, my argument would be so you say that. Um, so if I were to say this person did this because they preferred it, and you go, well, that's worthless. I would say, well, that's it's, actually it's a truism. Well, I, I would say that it's more valuable than saying um, an untrue statement. For instance, like this person preferred it because their religion told them to do it, right? I, I would argue, well, no. It, what's more fundamental is probably this person, through um, social conditioning or whatever, developed a preference okay, for yeah. the system. Yeah, and that that analysis would would hold more predictive value than just saying they they follow a religion because as soon as that religion starts to generate a bunch of of answers that runs contradictory to what that person feels either the religion will change or the person will abandon that those set of ideas to fulfill their preferences mm -hmm. but you know the i think the best way is still to give the content of the preference for example me uh i like lemon tarts i know why it's you like what lemon tarts oh, okay I, I know why it's because it reminds me of my childhood <laughs> easy mm -hmm. that's why my preference comes from here you know cozily you know there are different types of causes, blah blah blah, but you know this 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 cause, um, the formal cause, tells me that I like this because this reason, and I know this reason isn't grounded in an ethical way, so I can't. I am not justified in defending lemon tarts to someone who will not like them. Okay. So having the content of my preference, the logical content, the, the semantic content, gives me a way of arguing about values with someone. But the thing is that most people obviously don't really know where their values come from, right? They receive them culturally. Sure. And they haven't rationally examined them. Yeah, and for some, these are impossible to even figure out, but yeah. Well, yeah, obviously, it's very, very difficult. And so for some of them, discussion is possible. For some of them, it's really difficult. But mm -hmm. we, can, we can do it uh, in a community of inquiry, you know, in the pragmatist way. 
for example, we, we, there is a way to convince, like for example, veganism is a really strong philosophical position, right? Yeah. And there, it's really easy to argue for because the people you're going to argue with are going to share the values you have and which are the building grounds of the conclusion you're going to obtain in, yeah. in the end. Generally, 99% of people like things like pets and puppies and cats and don't want to see things. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. For sure. You just have to point to the contradictions and say, hey, you're not doing something that follows your own principles. And then yeah. the person will go, oh, well, that's, that's, that's terrible. I must change my behavior. And sometimes you have to go much deeper. Sometimes you have to attack the epistemic systems. Sure. And that's very difficult, like unless you're a logician. The, the thing well, with, it's difficult because oftentimes they've never even engaged in that d thought directly, so they won't even understand well, yeah. their own. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I do philosophy in primary schools, and it's very difficult to engage kids about their values because those are received values. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, kids are not, uh, they are pre-rational beings. I'm not boring you, right? No, no, I, yeah. I, I mean, I agree and I understand what you're saying, right? No, no four-year-old like sits down and is like, all right, mom and dad, like help me put together my value system. Yeah. Like I'm going to start from this epistemological base and then we're going to build up, right? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So when you ask them, oh, why do you think this? Why do you think that? What are your justifications? Obviously, they don't have any. Mm -hmm. And as they grow up, they're going to form themselves as a rational agent uh, and as an ethical agent, and they're going to justify their behavior. But the thing is, uh, the, the, the material necessities and the conditions of growing up uh, inside a, a, a family, inside a home, inside a society, inside a culture, are going to determine this, this person's values in a way that is not rational at all. And when they eventually hit adulthood and when they have to account for their actions, they have never actually undergone the process of examining their values rationally. And nobody's gonna, nobody's ever going to come and tell them, oh, maybe, dude, you should think about the coherence of your ethical system and how well it aligns with society and your own preferences. Yeah. And it never, ever, ever happens. Yeah. And I might even be more harsh than you. The majority of people that I seem to engage with have never even begun to thought about these. Like what people, if you ask, like if you go one or two questions deep, they're completely lost as far as their own personal moral philosophy goes. Well, yeah. And it's terrible. And like in France, we have high school, uh, high school philosophy. And I think it's really fucking important that it, 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 it stays. Is it mandatory? There. What? Mandatory? It's mandatory. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we it's don't do that at all in, in the US, we don't. Yeah, it's not mandatory here either. So I, th I think it's terrible because then you have agiles who are not, you know, uh, I'm kind of rambling here, but uh, I'm making a point about the importance of justifying what you think, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just not considered enough in educational systems, I believe. All right. If you still want to argue about a, an ethical, to, an, ethical an, an ethical point, we can do that. Um. Yeah. I mean, maybe I might have to do. I don't want to like hammer the same points over and over again. I might have to do. Um. Are Are you like a capitalist or socialist or anything? Or uh, I don't really have any strong uh, political uh, political opinions. Oh sure. Okay. I like the problem when it comes to dealing with socialism is that I'm already analyzing everything through a capitalist lens, so it's really hard for me to like be moved on any of my points. Uh, and then I feel yeah. like I might be the same with this kind of like ethical descriptivism or this descriptive, I'm sorry, this descriptive egoism is I understand everything you're saying, but I can analyze everything you're saying through a, um, through like this kind of All like right. descriptive you know, egoism. You know that's cool, though. It's, it's called a principle mistake. Do what, you what, ever, or go ahead. Uh, what, what you're doing. It's an, it, it has a name. It's an epistemological error. Okay. It's, um, I think it's Auguste Comte. Uh, you know this guy, Kant, he has the law of three states. Ever hear about that? Nope. Um, basically, you say is like humanity goes through three stages. First stage is the religious stage where you explain shit by saying it, uh, it's it's uh, caused by supernatural beings such as gods, angels, the forces of nature, which are mystical in the stage, blah, blah, blah. Then you move on to a metaphysical stage in which you explain things with very big principles, such mm -hmm. as Egoism. And then you move on to a scientific stage in which you perform abductions, blah, 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 to reform your principles and make them much, much more specific. Uh, comparison behind the law of gravity, that's a mathematical relation, very complex, and the principle of the attraction of bodies in an ancient Greek philosophy, which said, oh, uh, planets gravitate towards each other because they love each other. So it accounts for the phenomenon, but not in a good way. And egoism, 
is the same thing. Like, obviously, you can always translate things to your explanation. And it's always going to find going to be satisfactory to you. But from an explanatory standpoint, it's less powerful than a more scientific analysis. That okay, actually, I, yeah, I understand. I think I fully understand I what you're saying. Very clear. What? I don't know if I'm being very clear. No, I think I understand. So, like, um, are you familiar? Okay, oh, I'm trying to trigger too much. Are you familiar with like determinism or compatibilism or whatever? Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so like, I would, I would call my. I think I have to be a compatibilist, but, but I'm, I'm a pretty hard determinist, I think. But if somebody were to ask me, um, why did you go outside yesterday and you know crash your car, and I were to answer, well, all of the antecedent variables inevitably led me to drive my car and crash it. That's not really a satisfactory answer. Like it's true, but it's not really explaining anything that is being talked about, right? Yeah. Okay. So then if somebody says, well, why did this person selflessly throw themselves on a grenade to save their four soldiers for me to say, well, obviously every biological being has a preference towards some sort of system and he was just exercising his. I'm not really, I mean, it's true. Nothing I'm saying is wrong, but it's not really describing or answering the question being asked. Right. Yeah, I see. Okay, sure. All right. Then, I think I understand. Okay. 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 So let's make an important distinction here. Mm -hmm. There is a thing called egoism, right? Sure. Okay. And this thing called egoism is characterized by the fact that you're going to do the things that benefits you over the things that benefit other people. Sure. Okay. And that means that what you call egoism is kind of different from what I just described. Um, so we have two things called kind egoism. Kind of. Kind of. Um, yeah. Depending on how, depending on how, because like if I, if I say something like, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, this is where it becomes kind of vacuous, right? Because if I say, like, well, the egoist um, is actually more most satisfied when he satisfies other people, right? Like, then then I can yeah. account for it in that way. But, th but then, it, it, but yeah, it becomes so like... So that means there, we, we have two egoisms in the end. Uh -huh. okay, you, know that, you know there are two ways of defining stuff? Um, um, what do you mean? Uh, well, when you define something, you are drawing an identity relationship okay. between two, two objects. So either you take something you already have, and you give it a name, or you try to circumscribe something that already exists. Okay, so that's different. So either you label something and you, you, you just name it. For example, I'm going to take all those numbers and call them the rational numbers. Or I already have something and I try to figure out what it is. For example, if I try to define justice, I already know that there is a thing called justice and that I'm trying to define it. Okay. But if I just say, oh, justice is uh, giving to people what they deserve, I am giving a stipulatory definition. Uh, so there are stipulatory definitions and non-stipulatory definitions. What you are doing with egoism is a stipulatory definition. You are taking things, certain properties, and you are saying it's called like this. Mm -hmm. It's called psychological egoism or whatever. you know. But the thing is that this thing that you describe isn't exactly the mental phenomenon that common sense calls egoism. Because egoism is a distinction between two different behaviors, a behavior that's going to benefit someone else and a behavior, and a, and a, sorry, mm -hmm. a behavior that's going to benefit the person themselves. Okay, yeah, I understand. I think I understand. So what you call egoism isn't what people call egoism. Gotcha. So why do you call it egoism in the end? So like, let's say something, extreme thought example. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of calling egoism egoism, you're, you're egoism. Destiny is egoism. Okay. I call it degoism. What does it mean now? How do I recognize it? Can I point out an action and say it's not degoist or it is degoist? No, because everything is degoist. Yeah. So, strictly speaking, I am not seeing anything at all. That That's what I mean when I, I say that psychological egoists are really, you know, they're not really saying anything and they're just stating a truism. It's, uh, they're just describing a very fundamental. For example, uh, for example, let's say you and me are in a room destiny. Mm -hmm. For example, you're, you're in my house right now. I, I, I have a studio and I point at an object and say, this is called an A. And for example, the object is a glass. So mm -hmm. you say, oh, okay, A is glass. A means glass. And then I say, you see everything in this room, everything is, is A or. Yeah. Yeah. And now I point at, I, I, ma I make a grand gesture at everything in the room and I say, everything in this room is B. You'd have no idea what B means. 
right? Okay. Sure. Well, so what, what you're saying isn't necessarily wrong. It just doesn't describe anything worthwhile. That's just a waste of time. Well, it doesn't describe anything at all. Yeah, because it describes everything. So it describes nothing, right? Right. So but how do you I, build... I, I, um... I'm going to have a hard time pulling you from this way of thinking uh -huh. because you've probably used it for a long time. Well, no, actually I haven't. I've only been here for about like a year, I think. I've, I've kind of like hopped around. Well, that's a long time. Oh, okay. You're um, young. I don't know. You must be like 26. I don't know. No, I'm 29. I'm getting there. Um, I guess like my, my question then is that like, how do you move? So if I am a, a soft moral realist, if that's what we said earlier, how do you move onto a higher level system that ascribes value from egoism? Like how do you, how do you define a set of um, right and wrongs on top of this? Oh, uh, well, that's a big ass topic. I have a personal position on the matter. Mm -hmm. But, um. What is your position? I'm just curious. What do you call yourself? I don't know, dude. Uh, the more I study philosophy, the less I am certain of anything. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of what I <laughs> felt like, unfortunately. I was very uh, confident about my philosophy 10 years ago when I was 19. And then the more and more I, I kind of like bounced around, like, yeah, it feels like I don't know anything about anything. <laughs> well, that's good. I think it made me a better person. Sure. Uh, but, uh,. Like, I think, like I said earlier, that we can meaningfully discuss ethics, right? Yeah. And so my criterion for something that's good, like in my life, the way I actually live, me, mm -hmm. will be something that's able to be justified according to certain epistemic norms that we share as a community. Would you and... still feel that way if I, if hypothetically speaking, and I know you hate hypotheticals, but let's say I were to justify a way to rape or murder hundreds of thousands of people would you still feel that those are virtuous actions or would you abandon that? I, I am I am absolutely confident in the way that they are not justifiable. That is not it justifiable. Is they are not justifiable that we deem them horrible. Okay. For example, um, you see how in popular culture, there's always violent movies, violent video games, stuff like that. Uh -huh. And you see how it's very rare that rape is showcased compared to violence. Yes. And... A reason for that is because violence is considered something that can be more easily justified than rape or torture. Oh, yeah. Because I would be really... I don't know if I like that appealing to societal norms, though, because what if I were to draw a distinction between the way that nudity and violence is portrayed in the in the United oh, States? I'm, I'm not appealing to societal norms. I'm just saying uh -huh. the norms we have right now are manifestations of an underlying principle. Right. Sure, but like, what? How do how do I approach something? How we feel, for instance, about boobs, right? So, like, in a lot of Western European countries, you guys are a lot more lax with that. Whereas in the United States, like, people would rather see somebody getting their teeth plied out than see like a woman's tit on the screen. Like, okay, well, you know, um, despite the fact that, in my opinion, mm -hmm. I will argue against that, there are bad reasons. There's still a rationality behind that. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are are going to um, usually the reason why. I hate nudity and overtly sexual content is because they believe an over-sexualization is going to lead to social unrest. Whereas the showcasing of violence wouldn't. Okay? So the, then the question becomes a question of fact. Mm -hmm. Does showing boobs actually fuck up society? And like, for example, I don't know, like France, we have a different relation to erotic content and it doesn't seem to fuck up society that much. Kind so of. It, well, it, fuck up. That's you're loading that. That's a big term, right? Yeah, but yeah. I'm like the, the actual content isn't super important. I just wanted you to see the structure of the thing. Sure, I kind of understand. Well, I guess I don't know if that might be the matter at hand because, like, for instance, like somebody, a, a religious person in the West would say, "Well, yes, yeah. it's absolutely fucked up society. Look at how many people are having sex outside of marriage now." But you would say, "Well, I don't consider that to be a fuck up of society." So you're kind of getting into these like. Well, then again, it's kind of we, we kind of come back to what we said earlier about epistemic norms, uh -huh. right? I'm only talking about people who meaningfully share my epistemic norms. Sure. And people who have, well, I'm very violently anti-clerical, me. Anti-clerical uh, meaning what does that mean? Anti like religious uh, dogma? I'm against religion. Okay. But I also recognize personal freedom, obviously. So it's a complicated situation to be in. But usually, I don't really, you know, take religious arguments into account. And I don't know, there's a bit of a different culture in my country. Like we are very secular, very, very secular. Gotcha. Okay. But um, anyway, yes. Um, the thing is that everything that we deem bad 
either we deem it bad for cultural reasons and it's not actually bad it's a mistake or it's actually bad and it's not justifiable you know being unjustifiable is a property of being bad yeah I, um fuck i feel like we could argue down we could go down on this forever so like for instance like let's say we have a society and someone is gay and somebody says yeah. being gay is bad yeah. you would say that's a mistake of society right well, sure, because what people if, can't argue for the fact that being gay is bad. Well, what if in that society, every single time a person came out as gay, they were murdered by another person? Would it would it then be bad? What do you mean? Like, let's say in a society, the somebody... Murdering is bad? What? The murdering is bad? Well, no, no, the, the, the person even being gay, would that, would that then become like a bad thing? Because if you're gay, you're going to be murdered? W would that be like a justifiably bad thing at that point? Or... Okay, well, um, the thing with bad and good uh -huh. is that they're like... Putnam makes this um, argument in Ethics Without Ontology. I think it's very good. Is that you know, in the same way, we there are very different kind of beauties. There are different way of talking about good and bad. Uh -huh. And the reason why concepts as such as good and bad um, like prevail in language is because they are very useful because they are very fuzzy. Um, but actually, when we, we we say that something is good, the actual judgment we have in our head is much more precise. It, it, it uh, admits a lot of clauses and specifications. So if, for example, some, your example, mm -hmm. the guy gets killed because he's an homosexual. Because everybody so being, in society views it as being an undesirable thing or something. Okay. Right. So we need to use more precise moral vocabulary to talk about the situation rather than simply good or bad. Okay. We can say that the person is entitled to being gay, but being gay is undesirable because it's going to lead to negative consequences. Uh-huh. And that seems to be a good description of the situation. Gotcha. The thing is that lay people think about morality in very broad strokes. Yeah. Because they don't need more precise brushes. Like they lead their lives just fine without doing moral philosophy. Mm -hmm. Except when it comes to very precise problems. Gotcha. Such as I don't know, abortion. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, cool. Give me. Are you a more realist now? Um, I don't know if that if by that guy's definition, am I, does that make me more realist if I believe that we can have? Well, I mean, if you want to, like, my advice will be: don't care, don't label <laughs> the fuck, you know. Because I, I don't think my that, position hasn't like changed at all. But I mean, if that's considered more realism, then sure. The point is to get Destiny to call himself a more realist, so his followers don't. Be like, oh, he's a moral. Well, then, like, realist. I'm just going going by something that this guy said earlier. We, your name is Neck, is that? Neck? Yeah, yeah. Going by something that he said earlier. Um, my 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 worry would be. So he said that when I describe egoism, that's not the same way that everybody describes egoism. So if I call something egoism, I'm not really doing justice to either myself, my audience, or the terminology itself, or the arguments that that would be bad. Uh, yeah, because you're, you're not giving information. Yeah. So I'm worried that if I say like when somebody and I this could be my lack of education, I fully admit. But when somebody tells me that they are a moral realist, they believe that morals are real. The in, the instant thing that I am thinking is that they believe that morality is something that can be objectively discovered in the universe. That morality is some objective thing that exists that can be discovered and understood by humans that is independent of humans which is i believe that's what Kant believes right isn't that it's not, it's not independent of humans makes no sense to talk about morality without humans so like, exists without beings would it wait say that again it makes no sense to talk about morality without beings sure i guess what i what i mean i'm sorry when i say independent of humans um what i mean is that it is possible for a society to all come to a decision about morality, but they could all be wrong, that there are actual moral rights and wrongs that exist, like independent of what any individual thinks, and that, that the existence of those moral right and wrongs can be discovered and understood by humans. That, that well, seems to be complicated uh -huh. because a cer certain part of morality depends on agreement, sure. such as, I don't know, executive justice, Okay. but another part of morality is uh, independent of the mind. For example, you can be in bad health, whether you know it or not, whether you not, you know, it's going to be bad for you regardless. Well, yeah, but I'm not really talking about because bad health is not th these aren't really like bad in, in a moral sense, right? Unless we decide to value health as a moral, but that's a separate moral question, right? Well, 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 you don't say that someone's in bad health. Yeah, but when you say bad, there, that's different than it's bad to kill someone. Oh yeah, what's the difference? Um, the difference is that one is a um, is that one is talking about a value and the other presumes the value. So, for instance, when you say somebody it's bad to murder someone you're saying that murder is bad but when you say um 
like somebody is in bad health, you're describing their health. You're saying that they're in bad health, but we're saying that because we should, we ought to value whether or not you should be healthy or not. No, no I'm saying that illness is bad. Oh, oh, oh. oh, yeah. Illness is bad is the same as saying murder is bad. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you say that someone's in bad health, you're saying that on the scale of illness and health, they're in the decision that's better. Um, hold on. Oof. I got to make sure this isn't like a, a language thing. Worse, not better. What the fuck? So like, hold on. I, I just got to make sure that, um, because this might be a language thing. So let's say, for instance, two people are racing, okay? And one person finishes um, in a way the worse time than the other person. If I say that that guy is a bad runner, that bad do, do you, runner, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. If I say that person is a bad runner, that's different than saying it's bad to murder someone, that these types of bads are different, right? Are you sure about that? Because you're clearly saying that this person hasn't done anything, uh, has done something wrong pertaining to the goal of winning the race. Yes. But so I, you're but, making but, a yeah. state? Um. Hold on. Oh, fuck. So I, I, I was under the impression that these aren't normative statements. Um, so, for instance, if I say something like something is bad because of a moral reason. So, for instance, murdering somebody is bad. For, that, 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 that is a normative statement. But if I say like... Um, what, 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 what do you feel is the defining criterion of moral uh, norm as opposed to other norms? Um, I, well, I thought that normative statements always refer to moral statements like oughts. Yeah. Like yeah, oughts and oughts, oughts in relation to, to moral statements. So, for instance, if I were to say, like, I ought to lift weights in order to become stronger, that that isn't necessarily, like, the same type of normative or a normative statement compared to that that's, like, a, just a descriptive statement. But if you say someone's a bad runner, uh, you're, you're, you're saying something about what a runner ought to be, right? You're saying that they fail to meet. Even if it's, like, uh, uh, um, you can translate any normative statement into a descriptive one by translating yep. it, by stating its goal, but it's still a normative statement at its core. You know, if you're saying like, if you want to win the race, you have to win like that, like that, like that. Mm -hmm. Just the way of saying you ought to be this, pertaining to this particular hypothetical goal, but, none, not, but nonetheless. And even further than that, it points at the real fact that says this kind of behavior is tied in this way to this kind of outcome. Yeah, but I thought that like you can make descriptive statements that might eventually lead you or might only arise because of a normative statement, but they would still be normative statements. So for instance, like you ought to murder a person would be a normative statement. But if I were to say that um, you ought to shoot that person in the head in order to mur murder them, that would be a descriptive statement. Not a, That's not a normative statement. Now, it would, all, it, it would tie back to the normative statement of you ought to murder them, but the way in which you do it would be like a descriptive statement, even if you use the word ought, that that's still a descriptive statement. Well... The reason is that every statement is actually normative. <laughs> yeah, but that's what I'm saying. That everything is, you know, is normative. Is, in nature. You know, it's kind of like we said earlier. Um, I mean, that's kind of a philosophical heavy thing. But um, yeah, because because my my gut reaction to that is you saying that every statement is a normative statement feels like me saying that every moral action is an egoist action. It feels like if we. Because I think I can draw a meaningful yeah, distinction. Gonna, or go ahead. I can expand on that if you'd like. Um, yeah, sure. It's more complicated. It's that um, you're going to presuppose values. Values taint every descriptive statement we make. So obviously, there is a difference in kind between descriptive statements and normative statements. But they're not so, you know, strictly separated as we'd like to think. Like, usually, you have to be very wary of hard dichotomies in philosophy. Sure. So, so for, for instance, if, if I were to say, like, the car is blue, well, normatively, mm -hmm. I valued blue as a distinction in color. Normatively, I've established that car is some sort of universal thing that we recognize like, like that. Well, um, not really in this precise case, but you get the idea. Okay. The thing is that you always have to use values. Even the mere way of giving a descriptive, the, the mere way, sorry, mm -hmm. the mere act of giving a description of a car is the manifestation of you already ascribing to certain epistemic norms, a theory of truth, a theory of logic that says, oh, we can say things about other things. Mm -hmm. We can att att attribute predicates to subjects, etc. Sure. This is and this is something that Ram has explained to me in the past, that before you can make yeah. any descriptive statement, you've necessarily already made a moral or value statement. You have to. You can't right. make. Yeah, sure. I understand that. When yeah. we're saying um, if you have to, if you, if you want to kill a person, you need to pull a trigger. Mm -hmm. In a way, uh, that's not clear cut, but in a way we're saying that there is a norm of efficiency pertaining to a goal, and that's a norm. And that's why the distinction between norms and facts isn't so, you know, closely 
not closely, sorry, isn't isn't so clear as we'd like to think. It's not as yeah. Sure, That's I understand what, what you're saying. Like, I, yeah, saying there's like a hard distinction might be false, but to say that everything is normative just seems like you're destroying like some. No, no, I was, I was I was making an exaggeration. For oh, okay, okay, sure, okay, gotcha. Uh, I think the, I would the, largely agree with everything you're going to say. It's like it's, it, oh, everything is tainted with normativity, or sure. always, and in a social way too. Like right now, you and me are following the rules of grammar. We are for following the rules of politeness. We are following certain rules of the debate like implicitly we're talking about specific things uh, and not like other things we're uh we're always already following rules mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah sure i understand and some of these rules are very difficult to talk about and some of them might be vacuous some of them are easily distinguishable such as you know grammar i can meaningfully talk about grammar easily mm -hmm. if i start talking in a certain way you're not going to understand me yeah and uh and other are very difficult. For example, if I start to talk about, I don't know, the ontological categories that make thought possible, mm -hmm. obviously it's gonna be much more vacuous. Okay, cool. All right. But if I were you, I wouldn't bother too much about calling yourself a realist or an anti-realist or whatever the fuck. I mean, that's like, when you actually read the fucking books, nobody cares about the labels, nobody, like, it's just something that's used so Wikipedia pages can be written. Yeah, the only reason I, well, the label is good is because it can communicate a lot of information very quickly. So if somebody says, yeah. well, what is your position on this? Rather than me having to talk for 20 minutes, I can say, oh, well, I'm this thing, right? I think it, it actually can be, I mean, it's, it's a nice shortcut, but in a way it also undermines the discussion because, you know, it's not the same for everyone. Your interlocutor can, can misunderstand you. I yeah. always think it's better to give your position extensively, even to it's sometimes a waste of time sure i actually when it comes to politics this is actually the position i've taken i don't use labels at all anymore because all it does is it obfuscates the conversation because people well, will, yeah yeah. yeah you know there's this um sociology school that uh, developed uh labeling theory that says if you actually use labels too much you're gonna um, you know be, start following your position for the wrong reasons and develop a sectarianist mind Blah, blah, blah. Sure, yeah. I, I would believe it in a heartbeat, yeah. As soon as you start to label things, you can ascribe so much to somebody that they don't actually believe in or something. Yeah, it's really toxic. And that as soon so as you give reason... a label, you've got to spend more time explaining why you don't agree with the label you've given yourself than actually things that you do agree with. So it just seems to be a waste of time at the end rather than you should just talk about individual issues or whatever, yeah. But because Destiny is in a position of influence, like he has quite a lot of social capital, um, I, as soon as he starts saying, you know, that he is an anti-realist, well, um, but so what this guy's saying is just not to use labels at all and just talk about my right. Particular so name. stop calling yourself a moral anti-realist when people ask you to, and if you're forced to, say you're a moral realist. Well, I, I think, think I just wouldn't say anything at this point. I would say this is my position. Oh, good. Morality, That's good. Because... Which is what I already do anyway, to be fair. But so well, there's this, yeah, there's this big topic in education about you know uh, epistemic duties we have towards people who are uh, yes. our intellectual minors. Yeah, like, so because of the people you're like, I, 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 I hang out sometimes in your Discord, mm -hmm. and I don't think you realize. Maybe you do. I don't think you realize possibly the extent to which people are influenced by your philosophical. Oh yeah, no, views. I know people. A lot of people like I. Uh, there are people now reading and being convinced by you know ask yourselves bullshit axiomatic system stuff, and who are now coherently <laughs> arguing. Axioms, boy. <laughs> exactly like axiom, my axiom is that i accept no axiom <laughs> <laughs> exactly you can justify absolutely anything it, it's pretty weird. you can't refute my axioms ram you're shit philosopher Fuck yeah, Trinity exactly College. You. Uh, so that's why i think that you should label yourself a hold on fuck i'm actually position you're in. this guy needs to stay awake don't let him go to sleep ram hold on i wonder if avi and ash are still at home <laughs> Like they are. They're in their chat. No, but they talk from that. fucking work and shit. Because I asked them earlier, but... It's fucking... They're both in America. Well, I don't know. Avi said that they're not normally available until the evening. Maybe it's time. I'm just... I really... I would love they're, to hear this conversation. They're in their chat right now. They're okay. In their Wait, oh, yeah. I sent a message to Avi. I'll see if he's... <laughs> if he's no, he's not going to. He's not going to. I told you. He is too afraid to... No, no, no. Well, you would have to be quiet or get kicked out. And then I would just let him talk to Neck. I would just love to hear this conversation. Nah, bro. I don't... I don't Oh, like no, Neck. You can't... You can't deprive us of this entertainment. That This is the type of thing that Neck <laughs> usually does. Nah. You see... You see like. 
I don't know the guy personally, and you see these the, guys. The, the listen, guy, Nick, you have an uh, you have a moral obligation. Yeah, these guys have a, have a obligation. whole Discord that they are showing these graphs to. A Discord of vegans. These are your people, okay? That they are misguiding with their <laughs> polyoly, super duper axiomatic y a priori right, axiom right. system. Okay, you have yeah. an obligation to help these people. Yeah, I also have an obligation to the class I have tomorrow at eight. Ah, oh, fuck. No, but on a more serious note, uh -huh. um, uh, like empirically, usually confrontative debate aren't worth it. Ah, oh, fuck. Uh, they're, they're worth it if there's an audience. Like right now, there's an audience, but I just I don't want to be your personal army. <sighs> okay. Yeah. But you can argue like me. Fine, I think. I I'd love to see you talk to. Abby. There's a there's a big difference between confrontative debates. And cooperative debates. Oh yeah, no, this is confrontative, one hundred percent. It's all in bad faith. I'm, also, I'm like, like you know, I'm not a native English speaker, and that's very frustrating because yeah. that makes me two hundred percent dumber. Yeah, I understand. There's a lot of people in chat that say that you speak English better than native speakers, though. So congratulations that's on that. Your English, nice. your Thank English you, is you. very, very good. You have an accent, but like your vocabulary is exemplary. It's very yes, good. Yes, I, I have to force myself not to speak like this. <laughs> oh God, like a, yeah. But on a more serious note, uh, it's, it's, it's actually tragic. I, I genuinely think this, that people who are wrong get a following. But it's mm -hmm. a necessary fact of our social dynamics. You know, people who are terrible public intellectuals, people who are toxic uh, politicians, like, I don't know, sect leaders, whatever, mm -hmm. they, they're going to get followings. Um, me, I prefer to focus on the kids I see regularly and try to arm them against those kind of people by teaching them about critical thought and philosophy and how to examine positions. Gotcha. Let me ask you this Rather time. than always engaging in, in fisticuffs with people all the time. I used to do that. And first of all, it's depressing <laughs> because it doesn't work. And also it's so, so, so... Like I've, 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 I've argued publicly with terrible people, Muslim extremists, rape apologists, nationalists of every kind you know people who are really fucking bad and it's it's it doesn't it doesn't produce anything of, of worth uh -huh. but what produces something of worth is to interest people and tell them okay i'm going to give you those tools that will allow you to examine positions and be smart and be your own intellectual guide in my opinion but so neck yeah you know that that post i made on that subreddit the, the companion to guilt thing what? The Companions okay. of Guilt post I made, remember? Thank On you. Destiny subreddit? Yeah, I think so. Um, do you think that was something worth doing? I don't know. Um, that's a good question. Um, Am I wasting my time when I could be reading Aristotle? I really think I like... The question is, I don't think I'm wasting my time because I, I get PMs every single day of well, people saying, yeah, that's you know, good. you got me into that's... philosophy. Like, that's the reason I come on these streams. I think, I think it depends on the gospel. Yeah, I think it depends on whether those people are going to authentically and honestly engage with philosophy in the long term. And if they do, then this time will, will have been productive. And if they don't, then you will, you'll have wasted your time. And I think that's usually, you know, the, the demographic of streamers isn't very concerned with philosophy. Mm. I, 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 I figure that you'd be probably wasting your time because people are going to be sh interested in, in a shallow way. But if you tell me that they're interested, well, that's, that's just great. And I think it's good that there are ways of interesting people who otherwise wouldn't. Opening parenthesis, but it has in a really good way. And that's very difficult. And I think you're a great student. Like everything you say, not only because we share positions, but also because I think you have a good epi epistemic disposition. But I also wonder sometimes if your time wouldn't be better invested by augmenting your power level and then becoming a teacher or something like that. But okay. on the other hand, I don't believe either that teacher exhausts their moral duty by teaching. That's a bit naive, I think. All right, Nick, you've convinced me. I'll read Aristotle. I'll read it for you. You already told me that one week ago and you haven't read shit. Damn. <laughs>
Hey, for my next um, just curious for my next philosophy book. So I read that fucking because I I feel like engagement with the literature, especially in something like philosophy, is probably really fucking important. Um, so I finally read my little intro book. The first formal philosophy book I've ever read was that Problems of Philosophy by Russell. Um, the next yeah. thing I want to get, I'm just going by like kind of like really general recommendations, and everybody has a totally different list. Descartes um, is a uh, is a uh, Plato's The Republic or Plato's The Republic. Sorry, do do you yeah. think that's a good next step or? It totally is. It's going to deal with a lot of issues that I think you'd be interested in. It's I also think. very entertaining and it touches on the whole, it touches a lot of different things. It's a great text, but also I'd like warn you of being overconfident while you engage with it. Um, it's falsely easy as a text, so to speak. Like a lot of time, it's it's much more subtle than it, it appears to be. Sure, and I for understand. Example, what you usually get is people who are who, who are they're gonna read the the, 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 the sorry the dialogues right, mm -hmm. and they're gonna say, oh well, uh, Plato is building a straw man uh, out of his Intel architecture, sure. right? But what they don't realize is that they're they're not actually arguing against the position; they're showing the weaknesses of their own. Gotcha. Uh, I understand. Okay, cool. I, I still recommend. There's a really you arrogant are. attitude towards Plato, like it's it's. You have to be super humble when you read philosophy. Not yeah. because you have to be humble absolutely all the time or because you have to be humble, you know. I I, 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 100, I totally get what you're just, saying. I it's typically, just a better way of engaging the text. Yeah, if, I, if I'm reading something written by an educated person, if I think that something is obviously wrong, I, I usually take more the idea that I must be missing That's something nice. rather than like this yeah. person is clearly wrong, right? Yeah. That's a good attitude. But yeah. you, have, you also have... To trust yourself. Okay. Like I don't at all when it comes to philosophy, but <laughs> okay, I'll try to. Do well, more. you see, you see, you see, there's this big. You know, there, are, there are like two attitudes when it comes to philosophy. There are people who are like, "Oh, it's a bunch of bullshit for arrogant assholes," and there are people who are like really unconfident about it. But the truth is that it, it, there's a bit of both. I mean, honestly, everybody can do it. Everybody can do it, and they do it all the time because everybody always justifies their actions. Everybody justifies their positions. They just do it in a non-professional way. Quote. But um, like I, I saw that you were re being really humble in the conversation, and that's very nice. You say, "Oh, I don't read, I don't, I don't know. I'm just blah blah blah." blah. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm, I'm also telling you, like, trust yourself, be confident, because you think what you think for a reason. Sure. Just examine, examine those reasons. If they're good, <clears throat> that's amazing. If they're bad, just reconsider them. Yeah, I try to. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. But, but the Republic is amazing. Gotcha. Then do you, wait, real quick. Do you have a translation that you recommend? In English? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm fucking French, dude. Yeah, that's right. Never mind. Fuck you. Okay. Check the Oxford one. Oxford uh, translation. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. Translations isn't very important. I mean, I just um. Well, I don't know, man. Christians yeah, argue over the right biblical translation. They feel pretty strongly about that sometimes. but. Yeah, but it, it doesn't matter at the level of first engagement. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. All right, I cool. recommend the Oxford one because it's the cheapest one. Gotcha. All right. I love you both very much. Thank you for the conversation, guys. See you, dude. Have a nice life. Yep. Thank <laughs> you.